The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 3, Section 3 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. The Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 3, Section 3. It has long been known that the occurrence of insanity follows an annual curve, and our knowledge of this curve, being founded on the date of admissions to asylums, cannot be said to be quite precise. It fairly corresponds to the outbreaks of acute insanity. The curve presented in chart 4 shows the admissions to the London County Council Lunatic Asylums during the years 1893 to 1897 inclusive. I have arranged it in two-month periods to neutralize unimportant oscillations. In order to show that this curve is not due to local or accidental circumstances, we may turn to France and take a special and chronic form of mental disease. Garnier, in his Folie à Paris, presents an almost exactly similar curve of the admissions of cases of general paralysis to the infirmier spéciale à Paris during the years 1886 to 88, chart 5. Both curves alike show a major climax in spring and a minor climax in autumn. Crime, in general, in temperate climates, tends to reach its maximum at the beginning of the hot season, usually in June. Thus, in Belgium, the minimum is in February, the maximum in June, thence gradually diminishing. Lentz, Bulletin Société, Médecin Mental Belgique, March 1901. In France, la Cassagne has summated the data extending over more than forty years, and finds that for all crimes, June is the maximum month, the minimum being reached in November. He also gives the figures for each class of crime separately, and every crime is found to have its own yearly curve. Poisonings show a chief maximum in May, with slow fall and a minor climax in December. Assassinations have a February and a November climax. Patricides culminate in May-June, and in October, La Cassagne tables are given by Laurent, Les Habitués de Prison de Paris, Chapter 1. Notwithstanding the general tendency for crime to reach its maximum in the first hot month, a tendency not necessarily due to the direct influence of heat, we also find, when we consider the statistics of crime generally, including sexual crime, that there is another tendency for minor climaxes in spring and autumn. Thus, in Italy, Penta, taking the statistics of nearly 4,000 crimes, murder, highway robbery, and sexual offenses, found the maximum in the first summer months. But there were also minor climaxes in spring and in August and September. Penta Revista Monsil de Psychiatria, 1899. In nearly all Europe, as shown by a diagram given by Lombroso and Lachy at the end of the first volume of Le Crime Politique, while the chief climaxes occur about July, there is, in most countries, a distinct tendency to spring usually about March and autumn, September and November, climaxes, though they rarely rise as high as the July climax. If we consider the separate periodicity of sexual offenses, we find that they follow the rule for crimes generally, and usually show a chief maximum in early summer. Aschaffenburg finds that the annual periodicity of the sexual impulse appears more strongly marked the more abnormal its manifestations, which he places in the following order of increasing periodicity. Conceptions in marriage, conceptions out of marriage, offenses against decency, rape, assaults on children, Centrale Blé, Fe Never Lucund, January nineteen oh three. In France, rapes and offences against modesty are most numerous in May, June, and July, 
as Villerme, La Cassagne, and others have shown. Villerme, investigating 1,000 such cases, found a gradual ascent in frequency only slightly broken in March, to a maximum in June, oscillating between May and July, when the years are considered separately, and then a gradual descent to a minimum in December. Le Gludic gives, for the 159 cases he had investigated, a table showing a small February-March climax, and a large June-August maximum, the minimum being reached in November-January. Le Gudic, Etendant au Marus, 1896, page 16. In Germany, Aschaffenburg finds that sexual offenses begin to increase in March and April, reach a maximum in June or July, and fall to a minimum in winter. Monat Schrift für Psychiatrie, 1903, Heft 2. In Italy, Penta shows that sexual offenses reach a minor climax in May, corresponding, in his experience, with the maximum for crimes generally, as well as with the maximum for conceptions, and a more marked climax in August-September. Penta, 1, Preventimenti Sessuali, 1893, page 115, ID Revista Mensuale de Psychiatrie, uh, 1899. Coe, in his Crime en Paix Creole, presents charts of the seasonal distribution of crime in Guadalupe, with relation to temperature, which show that while in a mild temperature like that of France and England, crime attains its maximum in the hot season. It is not so in a more tropical climate in July, when in Guadalupe the heat attains its maximum degree, crime of all kind falls suddenly to a very low minimum. Even in the United States, where the summer heat is often excessive, it tends to produce a diminution of crime. Dexter, in an elaborate study of the relationship of conduct to the weather, shows that in the United States, assaults present the maximum of frequency in April and October, with a decrease during the summer and the winter. The unusual and interesting fact demonstrated here, with a certainty that cannot be doubted, is, he concludes, that the unseasonably hot days of spring and autumn are the pugnacious ones, even though the actual heat be much less than for summer. We might infer from this that conditions of heat, up to a certain extent, are vitalizing, while at the same time irritating. But above that limit, heat is so devitalizing in its effects as to leave hardly energy enough to carry on a fight. E.g. Dexter, Conduct and the Weather, 1899, page 63, at sequence. It is not impossible that the phenomena of seasonal periodicity in crimes may possess a real significance in relation to sexual periodicity, if, as is possible, the occurrence of spring and autumn climaxes of criminal activity is due less to any special exciting causes at these seasons than to the depressing influences of heat and cold in summer and winter. It may appear reasonable to ask whether the spring and autumn climaxes of sexual activity are not really also largely due to a like depressing influence of extreme temperatures at the other two seasons. Not only is there periodicity in criminal conduct, but even within the normal range of good and bad conduct, seasonal periodicity may still be traced. In his Physical and Industrial Training of Criminals, H.D. Way gives charts of the conduct of seven prisoners during several years, as shown by the marks received. These charts show that there is a very decided tendency to behavior during summer and winter, while in spring, February, March, and April, and in autumn, August, September, and October, there are very marked falls to bad conduct, each individual tending to adhere to a conduct curve of his own. Way does not himself appear to have noticed this seasonal periodicity. Morrow, however, has investigated this question in Turin on a large scale and reaches results not very dissimilar from those shown by Way's figures in New York. 
he noted the months in which over four thousand punishments were inflicted on prisoners for assaults insults threatening language etc and shows the annual curve in tavola six of his caratteri de delinquenti there is a marked and isolated climax in may a still more sudden rise leads to the chief maximum of punishment in august and from the minimum in october there is rapid ascent during the two following months to a climax much inferior to that of may the seasonal periodicity of bad conduct in prisons is of interest as showing that we cannot account for psychic periodicity by invoking exclusively social causes this theory of psychic periodicity has been seriously put forward but has been investigated and dismissed so far as crime in holland is concerned by j r b de Roos in the transactions of the sixth congress of criminal anthropology at turin in nineteen o six archivo di psychiatria fash three nineteen o six the general statistics of suicides in continental europe show a very regular and unbroken curve attaining a maximum in june and a minimum in december the curve rising steadily through the first six months sinking steadily through the last six months but always reaching a somewhat greater height in may than in july morcelli shows that in various european countries there is always a rise in spring and in autumn october or november morcelli attributes these spring and autumn rises to the influence of the strain of the early heat and the early cold in england also if we take a very large number of statistics for instance the figures for london during the twenty years between eighteen sixty five and eighteen eighty four as given by ogle in a paper read before the statistical society in eighteen eighty six we find that although the general curve has the same maximum and minimum points it is interrupted by a break on each side of the maximum and these two breaks occur precisely at about march and october this is shown in the curve in chart six which presents the daily average for the different months the growth of children follows an annual rhythm wall the director of an educational establishment for homeless girls in denmark who investigated this question found that the increase of weight for all the ages investigated was constantly about thirty three per cent greater in the summer half year than in the winter half year it was noteworthy that even the children who had not reached school age and therefore could not be influenced by school life showed a similar though slighter difference in the same direction it is however Maling Henson, the director of an institution for deaf mutes in Copenhagen, who has most thoroughly investigated this matter over a great many years. He finds that there are three periods of growth throughout the year, marked off in a fairly sharp manner, and that during each of these periods, the growth in weight and height shows constant characteristics. From about the end of november up to about the end of march is a period when growth both in height and weight proceeds at a medium rate reaching neither a maximum nor a minimum increase in weight is slight the increase in height although trifling preponderating after this follows a period during which the children show a marked increase in height while increase in weight is reduced to a minimum the children constantly lose in weight during this period of growth in height almost as much as a gain in the preceding period. This period lasts from March and April to July and August. Then following the third period, which continues until November and December. During this period, increase in height is very slight, being at its early minimum. Increase in weight, on the other hand, at the beginning of the period, in September and October, is rapid and to the middle of December very considerable, daily increase in weight being three times as great as during the winter months. Thus, it may be said that the spring sexual climax corresponds roughly with growth in height and arrest of growth in weight, while the autumn climax corresponds roughly with a period of growth in weight and arrest of growth in height. Maling Hansen found that slight variations in the growth of the children were often dependent on changes in temperature, 
in such a way that a rise of temperature, even lasting for only a few days, caused an increase of growth, and a fall of temperature, a decrease in growth. At Hal, Schmidt Menard found that nearly all growth in weight took place in the second half of the year, and that the holidays made little difference. In America, Peckham has shown that increase of growth is chiefly from the 1st of May to the 1st of September. Among young girls in St. Petersburg, Jenchko found that increase in weight takes place in summer. Gopal found that increase in height takes place mostly during the first eight months of the year, reaching a maximum in August, declining during the autumn and winter, in February being nil, while in March there is sometimes loss in weight even in healthy children. In the course of a study as to the consumption of bread in normal schools during each month of the year, as illustrating the relationship between intellectual work and nutrition, Binet presents a number of curves which bring out results to which he makes no allusion, as they are outside his own investigation. Almost without exception, these curves show that there is an increase in the consumption of bread in spring and in autumn. The spring rise being in February, March, and April, the autumn rise in October or November. There are, however, certain fallacies in dealing with institutions like normal schools, where the conditions are not perfectly regular throughout the year, owing to vacations, etc. It is, therefore, instructive to find that under the monotonous conditions of prison life, precisely the same spring and autumn rises are found. Binet takes the consumption of bread in the women's prison at Claremont, where some 400 prisoners, chiefly between the ages of 30 and 40, are confined, and he presents two curves for the years 1895 and 1896. The curves for these two years show certain marked disagreements with each other, but both unite in presenting a distinct rise in April, preceded and followed by a fall, and both present a still more marked autumn rise, in one case in September and November, in the other case in October. Some years ago, Sir J. Crichton Brown stated that a manifestation of the sexual stimulus of spring is to be found in the large number of novels read during the month of March, Address in Psychology at the annual meeting of the British Medical Association, Leeds, 1889, Lancet, August 14th, 1889. The statement was supported by figures furnished by lending libraries and has been widely copied. It would certainly be interesting if we could so simply show the connection between love and season by proving that when the birds began to sing their notes, the young person's fancy naturally turns to brood over the pictures of mating in novels. I accordingly applied to Mr. Capel Shaw, chief librarian of the Birmingham Free Libraries, especially referred to by Sir J. Crichton Brown, who furnished me with the reports for 1896 and 1897 to 98. This latter report is carried on to the end of March 1898. The readers who use the Birmingham Free Lending Libraries are about 30,000 in number. They consist very largely of young people between the ages of 14 and 25. Somewhat less than half are women. Certainly, we seem to have here a good field for the determination of this question. The monthly figures for each of the ten Birmingham libraries are given separately, and it is clear at a glance that without exception the maximum number of readers of prose fiction at all the libraries during 1897 to 98 is found in the month of March. I have chiefly taken into consideration the figures for 1897 to 98. The figures for 1896 are somewhat abnormal and irregular probably owing to a decrease in readers, attributed to increased activity in trade, and partly to a disturbing influence caused by the opening of a large new library in the course of the year, certainly increasing the number of readers, and drafting off borrowers from some kind of other libraries. Not only so, but there is a second or autumnal climax, almost equaling the spring climax, and occurring with equal certainty, appearing during 1897-98, to either in October or November, and during 1896, 
constantly in October. Thus, the periodicity of the rate of consumption of prose fiction corresponds with the periodicity which is found to occur in the conception rate and in sexual ecbolic manifestations. It is necessary, however, to examine somewhat more closely the tables presented in these reports and to compare the rate of the consumption of novels with that of the other classes of literature. In the first place, if, instead of merely considering the consumption of novels per month, we make allowance for the varying length of the months and consider the average daily consumption per month, the supremacy of March at once vanishes. February is really the month during which most novels are read during the first quarter of 1898, except at two libraries where February and March are equal. The result is similar if we ascertain the daily averages for the first quarter in 1897, while in 1896, which, however, as I have already remarked, is a rather abnormal year. The daily average for March in many of the libraries falls below that for January, as well as for February. Again, when we turn to the other classes of books, we find that this predominance which February possesses, and to some extent shares with March and January, by no means exclusively applies to novels. It is not only shared by both music and poetry, which would fit in well with the assumption of a sexual nisus, but the Department of History, Biography, Voyages, and Travels shares it also with considerable regularity. So, also, does that of Arts, Sciences, and Natural History, and it is quite well marked in Theology, Moral Philosophy, etc., and in Juvenile Literature. We even have to admit that the promptings of the sexual instinct bring an increased body of visitors to the reference library where there are no novels for here also both the spring and autumnal climaxes are quite distinct certainly this theory carries us a little too far the main factor in producing this very marked annual periodicity seems to me to be wholly unconnected with the sexual impulse the winter half of the year from the beginning of october to the end of march when outdoor life has lost its attractions and much time must be spent in the house is naturally the season for reading but during the two central months of winter december and january the attraction of reading meets with a powerful counter attraction in the excitement produced by the approach of christmas and the increased activity of social life which accompanies and for several weeks follows christmas in this way the other four winter months october and november at the autumnal end and february and march at the spring end must inevitably present the two chief reading climaxes of the year and so the reports of lending libraries present us with figures which show a striking but fallacious resemblance to curves which are probably produced by more organic causes I am far from wishing to deny that the impulse which draws young men and women to imaginative literature is unconnected with the obscure promptings of the sexual instinct, but until the disturbing influence I have just pointed out is eliminated, I see no evidence here for any true seasonal periodicity. Possibly in prisons, the value of which as laboratories of experimental psychology we have scarcely yet begun to realize, more reliable evidence might be obtained and those French and other prisons where novels are freely allowed to the prisoners might yield evidence as regards the consumption of fiction as instructive as that yielded at Clermont concerning the consumption of bread. Certain diseases show a very regular annual curve. There is notably the case with scarlet fever. Kager found in a London fever hospital a marked seasonal prevalence. There was a minor climax in May, repeated in July, and a great autumnal climax in October, falling to a minimum in December and January. This curve corresponds closely to that usually observed in London. It is not peculiar to London or to urban districts, for in rural districts we find nearly the same spring minor maximum and major autumnal maximum. In Russia it is precisely the same. Many other epidemic diseases show very similar curves. An annual curve may be found in the expulsive force of the bladder as measured by the distance to which the urinary stream can be projected. This curve, as ascertained for one case, is interesting in account of the close relationship between sexual and vesicle activity 
after a minimum point in autumn there is a rise through the early part of the year to a height maintained through spring and summer and reaching its maximum in august this may be said to correspond with the general tendency found in some cases of nocturnal seminal emissions from a winter minimum to an autumn maximum there is an annual curve in voluntary muscle strength thus in antwerp where the scientific study of children is systematically carried out by a pedological bureau scheuten found that measured by the dynamometer both at the ages of eight and nine both boys and girls showed a gradual increase of strength from october to january a fall from january to march and a rise to june or july March was the weakest month, June and July the strongest. Scheuten also found an annual curve for mental ability, as tested by power of attention, which for much of the year corresponded to the curve of muscular strength, being high during the cold winter months. Lobsien at Kiel, seeking to test Scheuten's results and adopting a different method so as to gauge memory as well as attention, came to conclusions which confirmed those of Scheuten. They found a very marked increase of ability in December and January, with a fall in April. April and May were the minimum months, while July and October also stood low. The inquiries of Scheuten and Lobsien thus seemed to indicate that the voluntary aptitudes of muscular and mental force in children reach their maximum at a time of year when most of the more or less involuntary activities we have been considering show a minimum of energy. If this conclusion should be confirmed by more extended investigations, it would scarcely be matter for surprise and would involve no true contradiction. It would, indeed, be natural to suppose that the voluntary and regulated activities of the nervous system should work most efficiently at those periods when they are least exposed to organic and emotional disturbance. So persistent a disturbing element in spring and autumn suggests that some physiological conditions underlie it, and that there is a real metabolic disturbance at these times of the year. So few continuous observations have yet been made on the metabolic processes of the body that it is not easy to verify such a surmise with absolute precision. Edward Smith's investigations, so far as they go, support it. Perry Cost's long-continued observations of pulse frequency seem to show with fair regularity a maximum in early spring and another maximum in late autumn. I may also note that Haig, who has devoted many years of observations to the phenomena of uric acid excretion, finds that uric acid tends to be highest in the spring months, March, April, May, and lowest at the first onset of cold in October. Thus, while the sexual climaxes of spring and autumn are rooted in animal procreative cycles, which in man have found expression in primitive festivals, these again perhaps strengthening and developing the sexual rhythm, they yet have a wider significance. They constitute one among many manifestations of spring and autumn physiological disturbance corresponding with fair precision to the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. They resemble those periods of atmospheric tension, of storm and wind, which accompany the spring and autumn phases in the Earth's rhythm, and they may fairly be regarded as ultimately a psychological reaction to those cosmic influences. End of the Phenomena of Sexual Periodicity, Part 3, Section 3. Recording by John Thomas Coos. Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, Part 1, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christopher Most. Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, part one, section one. By autoeroticism I mean the phenomena of spontaneous sexual emotion generated in the absence of an external stimulus proceeding, directly or indirectly, from another person. In a wide sense, which cannot be wholly ignored here, Autoeroticism may be said to include those transformations of repressed sexual activity which are a factor of some morbid conditions as well as of the normal manifestation of art and poetry, and indeed, more or less color the whole life. 
such a definition excludes the normal sexual excitement aroused by the presence of a beloved person of the opposite sex it also excludes the perverted sexuality associated with an attraction to the person of the same sex it further excludes the manifold forms of erotic fetishism in which the normal focus of sexual attraction is displaced and voluptuous emotions are aroused only by some object hair shoes garments etc which to the ordinary lover are of subordinate though still indeed considerable importance the autoerotic field remains extensive it ranges from occasional voluptuous daydreams in which the subject is entirely passive to the perpetual unashamed efforts at sexual self-manipulation witnessed among the insane it also includes though chiefly as curiosities those cases in which individuals fall in love with themselves among autoerotic phenomena or on the borderland we must further include those religious sexual manifestations for an ideal object of which we may find evidence in the lives of saints and ecstatics the typical form of autoeroticism is the occurrence of the sexual orgasm during sleep i do not know that any apology is needful for the invention of the term autoerotism there is no existing word in current use to indicate the whole range of phenomena i am here concerned with we are familiar with masturbation but that strictly speaking only covers a special and arbitrary subdivision of the field although it is true the subdivision with which physicians and alienists have chiefly occupied themselves self abuse is somewhat wider but by no means covers the whole ground while for various reasons it is an unsatisfactory term onanism is largely used especially in france and some writers even include all forms of homosexual connection under this name it may be convenient to do so from a physiological point of view but it is a confusing and antiquated mode of procedure and from the psychological standpoint altogether illegitimate onanism ought never to be used in this connection if only on the ground that onan's device was not autoerotic but an early example of withdrawal before emission or coitus interruptus while the name that i have chosen may possibly not be the best there should be no question as to the importance of grouping all these phenomena together it seems to me that this field has rarely been viewed in a scientifically sound and morally sane light simply because it has not been viewed as a whole we have made it difficult so to view it by directing our attention on the special group of autoerotic facts that group included under masturbation which was most easy to observe and which in an extreme form came plainly under medical observation in insanity and allied conditions and we have willfully torn this group of facts away from the larger group to which it naturally belongs the questions which have been so widely so diversely and it must unfortunately be added often so mischievously discussed concerning the nature and evils of masturbation are not seen in their true light and proportions until we realize that masturbation is but a specialized form of a tendency which in some form or in some degree normally affects not only man but all higher animals from a medical point of view it is often convenient to regard masturbation as an isolated fact but in order to understand it we must bear in mind its relationships in the study of autoerotism i shall frequently have occasion to refer to the old entity of masturbation because it has been more carefully studied than any other part of the autoerotic field but i hope it will always be borne in mind that the psychological significance and even the medical diagnostic value of masturbation cannot be appreciated unless we realize that it is an artificial subdivision from a great group of natural facts the study of autoerotism is far from being an unimportant or merely curious study, yet psychologists, medical and non-medical, almost without exception, treat its manifestations, when they refer to them at all, in a dogmatic and offhand manner which is far from scientific. It is not surprising, therefore, that the most widely divergent opinions are expressed. Nor is it surprising that ignorant and chaotic notions among the general population should lead to results that would be ludicrous if they were not pathetic. To mention one instance known to me. A married lady who is a leader in social purity movements and an enthusiast for sexual chastity discovered, through reading some pamphlet against solitary vice, that she herself had been practicing masturbation for years without knowing it. The profound anguish and hopeless despair of this woman in face of what she believed to be the moral ruin of her whole life cannot be well described. It would be easy to give further examples, though a scarcely more striking one, to show utter confusion into which we are thrown by leaving this matter in the hands of the blind leaders of the blind moreover the conditions of modern civilization render autoerotism a matter of increasing social significance as our marriage rate declines and as illicit sexual relationship continue to be openly discouraged it is absolutely inevitable that autoerotic phenomena of one kind or another not only among women but among men should increase among us both in amount and intensity it becomes therefore a matter of some importance both to the moralist and the physician to investigate the psychological nature of these phenomena and to decide precisely what their attitude should be toward them I do not purpose to enter into a thorough discussion of all the aspects of autoerotism. 
That would involve a very extensive study indeed. I wish to consider briefly certain salient points concerning autoerotic phenomenon, especially their prevalence, their nature, and their moral, physical, and other effects. I base my study partly on the facts and opinions which, during the last thirty years, have been scattered through the periodical and other medical literature of Europe and America, and partly on the experience of individuals, especially of fairly normal individuals. Among animals in isolation, and sometimes in freedom, though this can less often be observed, it is well known that various forms of spontaneous solitary sexual excitement occur. Horses, when leading a lazy life, may be observed flapping the penis until some degree of emission takes place. Welsh ponies, I learn from a man who has had much experience with these animals, habitually produce erections and emissions in their stalls. They do not bring their hind quarters up during this process, and they close their eyes, which does not take place when they have congress with mares. The same informant observed that bulls and goats produce emissions by using their forelegs as a stimulus, bringing up their hind quarters, and mares rub themselves against objects. I am informed by a gentleman who is a recognized authority on goats, that they sometimes take the penis into the mouth and produce actual orgasm, thus practicing autofellatio. As regards ferrets, the Reverend H. Norcote states, I am informed by a gentleman who has had considerable experience of ferrets, that if the bitch, when in heat, cannot obtain a dog, she pines and becomes ill. If a smooth pebble is introduced into the hutch, she will masturbate upon it, thus preserving her normal health for one season. But if this artificial substitute is given to her a second season, she will not, as formerly, be content with it. Stags in the rutting season, when they have no partners, rub themselves against trees to produce ejaculation. Sheep masturbate, as also do camels, pressing themselves down against convenient objects, and elephants compress the penis between the hind legs to obtain emissions. Blumenbach observed a bear act somewhat similarly upon seeing other bears coupling, and hyenas, according to Ploss and Bartels, have been seen practicing mutual masturbation by licking each other's genitals. Mammary masturbation, remarks Ferrer, is found in certain female and even male animals, like the dog and cat. Apes are much given to masturbation, even in freedom, according to the evidence of good observers, for while no female apes are celibates, many of the males are obliged to lead a life of celibacy. Male monkeys use the hand in masturbation, to rub and shake the penis. In the human species, these phenomena are by no means found in civilization alone. To whatever extent masturbation may have been developed by the conditions of European life, which carry to the utmost extreme the concomitant stimulation and repression of sexual emotions, it is far from being, as Mantegaza has declared it to be, one of the moral characteristics of Europeans. It is found among the people of nearly every race in which we have any intimate knowledge, however natural the conditions under which men and women may live. Thus, among the Nama Hottentots, among the young women at all events, Gustav Frisch found that masturbation is so common that it is to be regarded the custom of the country. No secret is made of it, and in the stories and legends of the race it is treated as one of the most ordinary facts of life. It is so also among the Basutos, and the Kafirs are addicted to the same habit. The Fugians have a word for masturbation, and a special word for masturbation by women. When the Spaniards first arrived at Vizcaya, in the Philippines, they found that masturbation was universal, and that it was customary for the women to use an artificial penis and other abnormal methods of sexual gratification. Among the Balinese, according to Jacobs, as quoted by Ploss and Bartels, masturbation is general. In the boudoir of many a Bali beauty, he adds, and in every harem, may be found a wax penis to which many hours of solitude are devoted. Throughout the East, as Aram, speaking from a long medical experience, has declared, masturbation is very prevalent, especially among young girls. In Egypt, according to Sonini, it is prevalent in harems. In India, a medical correspondent tells me he once treated the widow of a wealthy Mohammedan, who informed him that she began masturbation at an early age, just like all other women. The same informant tells me that on the façade of a large temple in Orissa are bas-reliefs, representing both men and women alone, masturbating, and also women masturbating men. Among the Tamils of Ceylon, masturbation is said to be common. In Cochin, China, Lorian remarks, it is practiced by both sexes, but especially by the married women. Japanese women have probably carried the mechanical arts of autoerotism to the highest degree of perfection. They use two hollow balls about the size of a pigeon's egg, sometimes one alone is used, which, as described by Jost, Christian, and others, are made of very thin leaves of brass. One is empty. The other, called the little man, contains a small heavy metal ball or else some quicksilver, and sometimes metal tongues which vibrate when set in movement, so that if the balls are held in the hands side by side, there is a continuous movement. The empty one is first introduced into the vagina in contact with the uterus, then the other. The slightest movement of the pelvis or thighs, or even spontaneous movement of the organs, causes the metal ball, or quicksilver, to roll, and the resulting vibration produces a prolonged voluptuous titillation, a gentle shock as from a weak electric inductive apparatus. The balls are called rin no tama and are held in the vagina by a proper tampon. 
The women who use these balls delight to swing themselves in a hammock or rocking chair, the delicate vibration of the ball slowly producing the highest degree of sexual excitement. Jost mentions that this apparatus, though well known by name to ordinary girls, is chiefly used by the more fashionable geishas, as well as by prostitutes. Its use has now spread to China, Anam, and India. Japanese women also, it is said, frequently use an artificial penis of paper and clay called engi. Among the Ache, again, according to Jacobs, as quoted by Ploss, the young of both sexes masturbate and the elder girls use an artificial penis of wax. In China, also, the artificial penis, made of rosin, supple, and, like the classical instrument described by Harondas, rose-colored, is publicly sold and widely used by women. It may be noticed that among non-European races it is among women, and especially among those who are subjected to the excitement of a life professionally devoted to some form of pleasure, that the use of the artificial instruments of autoerotism is chiefly practiced. The same is markedly true in Europe. The use of an artificial penis in solitary sexual gratification may be traced down from classic times, and doubtless prevailed in the very earliest human civilization, for such an instrument is said to be represented in old Babylonian sculptures, and it is referred to by Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 17. The lesbian women are said to have used such instruments, made of ivory or gold, with silken stuffs and linen. Aristophanes, in Lysistrata, verse 109, speaks of the manufacture by Milesian women of leather artificial penis, or lesbos. In the British Museum is a vase representing the hetaira holding such instruments, when, as found at Pompeii, may be seen in the museum at Naples. One of the best of Herondas's mimes, The Private Conversation, presents a dialogue between two ladies concerning a certain Olisbos, which one of them vaunts as a dream of delight. Through the Middle Ages, when from time to time the clergy reprobated the use of such instruments, they continued to be known, and after the fifteenth century the references to them became more precise. Thus Fortini, the Sienese novelist of the sixteenth century, refers in his Novelle del Novisi, Seventh Day, Novella 34, to the glass object filled with warm water which nuns use to calm the sting of the flesh and to satisfy themselves as well as they can. He adds that widows and other women anxious to avoid pregnancy availed themselves of it. In Elizabethan England, at the same time, it appears to have been of a similar character, and Marston, in his satires, tells how Lucia prefers a glassy instrument to her husband's lukewarm bed. In sixteenth-century France, also, such instruments were sometimes made of glass, and Brantome refers to the godmiche. In eighteenth-century Germany they were called samtanze, and their use, according to Heinz, as quoted by Duren, was common among aristocratic women. In England, by that time, the dildo appears to have become common. Archimholt states that while in Paris they are sold secretly. In London, a certain Mrs. Phillips sold them openly on a large scale in her shop in Leicester Square. John B., in 1835, stating that the name was originally Dill Doll, remarks that their use was formerly commoner than it was in his day. In France, Madame Gordon, the most notorious brothel-keeper of the 18th century, carried on a wholesale trade in consolateurs, as they were called, and at her death numberless letters from abbesses and simple nuns were found among her papers, asking for a consolateur to be sent. The modern French instrument is described by Gamier as of hardened red rubber, exactly imitating the penis and capable of holding warm milk or other fluid for injection at the moment of orgasm. The compressible scrotum is said to have been first added in the 18th century. In Islam, the artificial penis has reached nearly as high a development as in Christendom. Turkish women use it, and it is said to be openly sold in Smyrna. In the harems of Zanzibar, according to Bauman, it is of considerable size, carved out of ebony or ivory, and commonly bored so that warm water may be injected. It is here regarded as an Arab invention. Somewhat similar appliances may be traced in all centers of civilization, but throughout they appear to be frequently confined to the world of prostitutes and to those women who live on the fashionable or semi-artistic verge of that world. Ignorance and delicacy combine with a less versatile and perverted concentration on the sexual impulse to prevent any general recourse to such highly specialized methods of solitary gratification. On the other hand, the use, or rather abuse, of the ordinary objects and implements of daily life in obtaining autoerotic gratification among the ordinary population in civilized modern lands has reached an extraordinary degree of extent and variety we can only feebly estimate by the occasional resulting mischances which come under the surgeon's hands, because only a certain proportion of such instruments are dangerous. Thus the banana seems to be widely used for masturbation by women, and appears to be marked out for the purpose by its size and shape. It is, however, innocuous, and never comes under the surgeon's notice. The same may probably be said of the cucumbers and other vegetables more especially used by country and factory girls in masturbation. A lady living near Vichy told Paulier that she had often heard, and had herself been able to verify the fact, that the young peasant women commonly used turnips, carrots, and beetroots. In the eighteenth century Mirabeau, in his Erotica Biblion, gave a list of the various objects used in convents, which he describes as vast theatres of such practices, to obtain solitary sexual excitement. 
In more recent years, the following are a few of the objects found in the vagina or bladder whence they could only be removed by surgical interference. Pencils, sticks of sealing wax, cotton reels, hairpins, and in Italy very commonly the bone pins used in the hair, bodkins, knitting needles, crochet needles, needle cases, compasses, glass stoppers, candles, corks, tumblers, forks, toothpicks, toothbrushes, pomade pots, in a case recorded by Schroeder with a cock chafer inside, a makeshift substitute for the Japanese rin no tama. While in one recent English case a full-sized hen's egg was removed from the vagina of a middle-aged married woman. More than nine-tenths of the foreign bodies found in the female bladder or urethra are due to masturbation. The age of the individuals in whom such objects has been found is usually from seventeen to thirty, but in a few cases they have been found in girls below fourteen. Infrequently in women between forty and fifty, the large objects, naturally, are found chiefly in the vagina and in married women. Hairpins have, above all, been found in the female bladder with special frequency. This point is worth some consideration as the illustration of the enormous frequency of this form of autoerotism. The female urethra is undoubtedly a normal center of sexual feeling, as Pollier pointed out many years ago. A woman medical correspondent, also, writes that in some women the maximum of voluptuous sensation is at the vesicle sphincter or orifice, though not always so limited. E. H. Smith, indeed, considers that the urethra is the part in which the orgasm occurs, and remarks that in sexual excitement mucus always flows largely from the urethra. It should be added that when once introduced, the physiological mechanism of the bladder apparently causes the organ to tend to swallow the foreign object. Yet for every case in which the hairpin disappears and is lost in the bladder, from carelessness or the oblivion of the sexual spasm, there must be a vast number of cases in which the instrument is used without any such unfortunate result. There is thus great significance in the frequency with which cases of hairpin in the bladder are strewn through medical literature of all countries. In 1862, a German surgeon found the accident so common that he invented a special instrument for extracting the hairpins from the female bladder, as, indeed, Italian and French surgeons also have done. In France, de Nusse, of Bordeaux, came to the conclusion that hairpin in the bladder is the commonest result of masturbation as known to the surgeon. In England, cases are constantly being recorded. Lawson Tate stating that most cases of stone in the bladder in women are due to the introduction of a foreign body, very often a hairpin, adds, I have removed hairpins encrusted with phosphates from ten different female bladders, and not one of the owners of these bladders would give any account of the incident. Stokes, again, records that during four years he had four cases of hairpin in the female urethra. In New York, one physician met with four cases in a short experience. In Switzerland, Professor Reverdin had a precisely similar experience. There is, however, another class of material objects widely employed for producing physical autoerotism, which in the nature of things never reaches the surgeon. I refer to the effects that, naturally or unnaturally, may be produced by many of the objects and implements of daily life that do not normally come in direct contact with the sexual organs. Children sometimes, even when scarcely more than infants, produce sexual excitement by friction against the corner of a chair or other piece of furniture, and women sometimes do the same. Good seat, in Russia, knew women who made a large knot in their camises to rub against, and mentions a woman who would sit on her naked heel and rub it against her. Girls in France, I am informed, are fond of riding on the cheval de bois, or hobby horses, because of the sexual excitement thus aroused, and that the sexual emotions play a part in the fascination exerted by this form of amusement everywhere is indicated by the ecstatic faces of its devotees. At the temples in some parts of central India, I am told, swings are hung up in pairs, men and women swinging in these until sexually excited during the months when the men in these districts have to be away from home, the girls put up swings to console themselves for the loss of their husbands. It is interesting to observe that the very wide prevalence of a swinging, often of a religious or magic character, and the evident sexual significance underlying it, although this is not always clearly brought out. Gruse, discussing the frequency of swinging, refers, for instance, to the custom of the Gilbert Islanders for a young man to swing a girl from a cocoa palm, and then to cling on and swing with her. In ancient Greece, women and grown-up girls were fond of seesaws and swings. The Athenians had, indeed, a swinging festival. Songs of a voluptuous character, we gather from the Athenians, were sung by the women at this festival. J. G. Fraser discusses the question and brings forward instances in which men, or especially women, swing. The notion seems to be, he states, that the ceremony promotes fertility, whether in the vegetable or in the animal kingdom. Though why it should be supposed to do so, I confess myself unable to explain. The explanation seems, however, not far to seek in view of the facts quoted above, and Frazier himself refers to the voluptuous character of the song sometimes sung. Even apart from actual swinging of the whole body, a swinging movement may suffice to arouse sexual excitement, and may, at all events in women, constitute an essential part of methods of attaining solitary sexual gratification. Kiernan thus describes the habitual autoerotic procedure of a young American woman. 
The patient knelt before a chair, let her elbows drop on its seat, grasping the arms with a firm grip, then commenced a swinging, writhing motion, seeming to fix her pelvis and moving her trunk and limbs. The muscles were rigid, the face took on a passionate expression, the features were contorted, the eyes rolled, the teeth were set, and the lips compressed, while the cheeks remained purple. The condition bore a striking resemblance to the passional stage of grand hysteria. The reveling took only a moment to commence, but lasted a long time. The swaying induced a pleasurable sensation, accompanied with a feeling of suction upon the clitoris. Almost immediately after, a sensation of bursting, caused by discharge from the vulvo-vaginal glands occurs, followed by a rapture prolonged for an indefinite time. The accompanying sexual imagery is so vivid as to become also hallucinatory. J. G. Kiernan, Sex Transformation and Psychic Impotence, American Journal of Dermatology, Volume 9, Number 2. Somewhat similarly sensations of a sexual character are sometimes experienced by boys climbing up a pole. It is not even necessary that there should be direct external contact with the sexual organs, and Howe states that gymnastic swinging poles around which boys swing while supporting the whole weight on the hands may suffice to produce sexual excitement. Several writers have pointed out that the riding, especially in women, may produce sexual excitement and orgasm. It is well known, also, both in men and women, the vibratory motion of a railway train frequently produces a certain degree of sexual excitement, especially when sitting forward. Such excitement may remain latent and not become specifically sexual. I am not aware that this quality of railway traveling has ever been fostered as a sexual perversion, but the sewing machine has attracted considerable attention on account of its influence in exciting autoerotic manifestations. The early type of sewing machine, especially, was of a very heavy character, and involved much up-and-down movement of the legs. Langdon Down pointed out many years ago that this frequently produced some great sexual erethism which has led to masturbation. According to one French authority, it is a well-recognized fact that to work a sewing machine with the body in certain positions produces sexual excitement leading to orgasm. The occurrence of the orgasm is indicated to the observer by the machine being worked for a few seconds with uncontrollable rapidity. This sound is said to be frequently heard in large French workrooms, and it is a part of the duty of the superintendents to make the girls sit properly. During a visit, which I once paid to a manufactory of military clothing, Pollier writes, I witnessed the following scene. In the midst of the uniform sound produced by some thirty sewing machines, I suddenly heard one of the machines working with much more velocity than the others. I looked at the person who was working it, a brunette of eighteen or twenty. While she was automatically occupied with the trousers she was making on the machine, her face became animated, her mouth opened slightly, her nostrils dilated. Her feet moved the pedals with constantly increasing rapidity. Soon I saw a convulsive look in her eyes. Her eyelids were lowered. Her face turned pale and was thrown backward. Hands and legs stopped and became extended. A suffocated cry, followed by a long sigh, was lost in the noise of the workroom. The girl remained motionless for a few seconds, drew out her handkerchief to wipe away the pearls of sweat from her forehead, and after casting a timid and ashamed glance at her companions, resumed her work. The forewoman, who acted as my guide, having observed the direction of my gaze, took me up to the girl, who blushed, lowered her face, and murmured some incoherent words before the forewoman had opened her mouth to advise her to sit fully on the chair and not sit on its edge. As I was leaving, I heard another machine at another part of the room in accelerated movement. The forewoman smiled at me, and remarked that it was so frequent that it attracted no notice. It was specially observed, she told me, in the case of young work girls, apprentices, and those who sat on the edge of their seats, thus much facilitating friction of the labia. In cases where the sewing machine does not lead to direct self-excitement, it has been held, as by Fothergill, to predispose to frequency of involuntary sexual orgasm during sleep, from the irritation set up by the movement of the feet in sitting posture during the day. The essential movement in working the sewing machine is the flexion and extension of the ankle, but the muscles of the thighs are used to maintain the feet firmly on the treadle. The thighs are held together, and there is a considerable degree of flexion or extension of the thighs on the trunk. By a special adjustment of the body, and sometimes perhaps merely in the presence of sexual hyperesthesia, it is thus possible to act upon the sexual organs. But this is by no means a necessary result of using the sewing machine, and the inquiry of various women, with well-developed sexual feelings who are accustomed to work the treadle, has not shown the presence of any tendency in this direction. Sexual irritation may also be produced by the bicycle in women. Thus, Moll remarks that he knows many married women, and some unmarried, who experience sexual excitement when cycling. In several cases, he has ascertained that the excitement is carried as far as complete orgasm. This result cannot, however, easily happen unless the seat is too high, the peak in contact with the organs, and a rolling movement is adopted. In the absence of marked hyperesthesia, these results are only affected by a bad seat or an improper attitude, the body during cycling resting under proper conditions on the buttocks, and the work being mainly done by the muscles of the thighs and legs which control the ankles, flexions of the thigh on the pelvis being very small. Most medical authorities on cycling are of opinion that when cycling leads to sexual excitement, the fault lies more with the woman than with the machine. The conclusion does not appear to me to be absolutely correct. 
I find on inquiry that with the old-fashioned saddle, with an elevated peak rising towards the pubes, a certain degree of sexual excitement, not usually producing the orgasm, but, as one lady expressed it, making one feel quite ready for it, is fairly common among women. Lightston finds that irritation of the genital organs may unquestionably be produced in both males and females by cycling. The aggravation of hemorrhoids sometimes produced by cycling indicates also the tendency to local congestion. With improved flat saddles, however, constructed with more definite adjustment to the anatomical formation of the parts, this general tendency is reduced to a negligible minimum. A reference may be made at this point to the influence of tight lacing. This has been recognized by gynecologists as a factor of sexual excitement and a method of masturbation. Women who have never worn corsets sometimes find that on first putting them on, sexual feeling is so intensified that it is necessary to abandon their use. The reason of this, as Siebert points out in his book for El Turn, seems to be that the corset both favors pelvic congestion and at the same time exerts a pressure on the abdominal muscles which brings them into the state produced during coitus. It is doubtless for the same reason, as some women have found, that more distension of the bladder is possible without corsets than with them. End of Autoeroticism, Part 1, Section 1「A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse » Part 1, Section 2 of Studies on the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1 by Havelock Ellis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autoeroticism – A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the sexual impulse part one section two in a further class of cases no external object whatever is used to procure the sexual orgasm but the more or less voluntary pressure of the thighs alone is brought to bear upon the sexual regions it is done either when sitting or standing the thighs being placed together and firmly crossed and the pelvis rocked so that the sexual organs are pressed against the inner and posterior parts of the thighs. This is sometimes done by men and is fairly common among women, especially, according to Marchneau, among those who sit much, such as dressmakers and milliners, those who use the sewing machine and those who ride. Wedler remarks that in his experience in Scandinavia, thigh friction is the commonest form of masturbation in women. The practice is widespread and a medical correspondent in India tells me of a Brahmin widow who confessed to this form of masturbation. I am told that in London board schools at the present time, thigh rubbing is not infrequent among the girl scholars. The proportion mentioned in one school was about 10% of the girls over 11. The thigh rubbing is done more or less openly and is interpreted by the uninitiated as due merely to a desire to relieve the bladder. It is found in female infants. Thus Townsend records the case of an infant, eight months old, who would cross her right thigh over the left, close her eyes and clench her fists. After a minute or two, there would be complete relaxation, with sweating and redness of face. This would occur about once a week or oftener. The child was quite healthy, with no abnormal condition of the genital organs. The frequency of thigh friction among women as a form of masturbation is due to the fact that it is usually acquired innocently and it involves no indecorum. The Suetso reports the case of a girl of twelve who at school, when having to wait her turn at the water closet, for fear of wetting herself, would put her clothes between her legs and press her thighs together, moving them backwards and forwards in the effort to control her bladder. She discovered that a pleasurable sensation was thus produced and acquired the habit of practicing the maneuver for its own sake. At the age of 17, she began to vary it in different ways. Thus she would hang from a tree with her legs swinging and her chemise pressed between her thighs, which she would rub together. Thigh friction in some of its forms is so comparatively decorous a form of masturbation that it may even be performed in public places. Thus, a few years ago, while waiting for a train at a station on the outskirts of a provincial town, I became aware of the presence of a young woman sitting alone on a seat at a little distance, whom I could observe unnoticed. 
She was leaning back with legs crossed, swinging the crossed foot vigorously and continuously. This continued without interruption for 10 minutes after I first observed her. Then the swinging movement reached a climax. She leaned still further back, thus bringing the sexual region still more closely in contact with the edge of the bench and straightened and stiffened her body and legs in what appeared to be a momentary spasm. There could be little doubt as to what had taken place. A few moments later, she slowly walked from her solitary seat into the waiting room and sat down among the other waiting passengers. Quite still now and with uncrossed legs, a pale, quiet young woman, possibly a farmer's daughter, serenely unconscious that her maneuver had been detected and very possibly herself ignorant of its true nature. There are many other forms in which the impulse of autoerotism presents itself. Dancing is often a powerful method of sexual excitement, not only among civilized but among savage peoples. And Zakh describes the erotic dances of Swahili women as having a masturbatory object. Stimulation of the nades is a potent adjuvant to the production of self-excitement and self-flagellation with rods, etc., is practiced by some individuals, especially young women. Urtication is another form of this stimulation. Revedin knew a young woman who obtained sexual gratification by flogging herself with chestnut burrs, and it is stated that in some parts of France, it is not uncommon for young girls to masturbate by rubbing the leaves of the Linaria symbolaria, here called Pinton or Timbard, onto the sexual parts, thus producing a burning sensation. Stimulation of the mamma, normally an erogenous center in women, may occasionally serve as a method for obtaining autoerotic satisfaction, including the orgasm in both sexes. I have been told of a case in a man, and a medical correspondent in India informs me that he knows a Eurasian woman addicted to masturbation, who can only obtain the orgasm by rubbing the genitals with one hand, while with the other she rubs and finally squeezes her breast. The tactile stimulation even of regions of the body, which are not normally erogenous zones in either sex, may sometimes lead on to sexual excitement. Hertzsprung, as well as Freud, believes that this is often the case as regards finger-sucking and toe-sucking, in infancy. Even stroking the chin, remarks Debreen, may produce a pollution. Taylor refers to the case of a young woman of 22 who was liable to attacks of choric movements of the hands which would terminate in alternately pressing the middle finger on the tip of the nose and the triggers of the ear when a far away pleased expression would appear on her face. She thus produced sexual excitement and satisfaction. She had no idea of wrongdoing and was surprised and ashamed when she realized the nature of her act. Most of the foregoing examples of autoerotism are commonly included, by no means correctly, under the heading of masturbation. There are, however, a vast number of people possessing strong sexual emotions and living a solitary life who experience, sometimes by instinct and sometimes on moral grounds, a strong repugnance for these manifestations of autoerotism. As one highly intelligent lady writes, I have sometimes wondered whether I could produce it, that is complete sexual excitement, mechanically. But I have a curious, unreasonable repugnance to trying the experiment. It would materialize it too much. The same repugnance may be traced in the tendency to avoid, so far as possible, the use of hands. It is quite common to find this instinctive, unreasoning repugnance among women, a healthy repugnance not founded on any moral ground. In men, the same repugnance exists, more often combined with or replaced by a very strong moral and aesthetic objection to such practices. But the presence of such a repugnance, however invincible, is very far from carrying us outside the autoerotic field. The production of the sexual orgasm is not necessarily dependent on any external contact or voluntary mechanical cause. As an example, though not of specifically autoerotic manifestations, 
I may mention the case of a man of 57, a somewhat eccentric preacher, etc., who writes, My whole nature goes out so to some persons, and they thrill and stir me so, that I have an emission while sitting by them, with no thought of sex, only the gladness of soul found its way out thus, and a glow of health suffused the whole body. There was no spasmodic conclusion, but a pleasing, gentle sensation, as a few drops of semen passed. In reality, no doubt, not semen, but urethral fluid. This man's condition may certainly be considered somewhat morbid. He is attracted to both men and women, and the sexual impulse seems to be irritable and weak. But a similar state of things exists so often in women, no doubt due to sexual repression, and in individuals who are in a general state of normal and good health, that in these it can scarcely be called morbid. Brooding on sexual images, which the theologians termed delectatio morosa, may lead to spontaneous orgasm in either sex, even in perfectly normal persons. Hammond described as a not uncommon form of psychic coitus, a condition in which the simple act of imagination alone, in the presence of the desired object, suffices to produce orgasm. In some public conveyance, theatre, or elsewhere, the man sees a desirable woman, and by concentrating his attention on her person, and imagining all the states of intimacy, he quickly succeeds in producing orgasm. Nice Ferro refers to an Italian work girl of fourteen who could obtain ejaculation of mucus four times a day in the workroom in the presence of the other girls, without touching herself or moving her body, by simply thinking of sexual things. If the orgasm occurs spontaneously, without the aid of mental impressions, or any manipulations ad hoc, though under such conditions it ceases to be sinful from the theological standpoint, it certainly ceases also to be normal. Serio records the case of a somewhat neurotic woman of fifty who had been separated from her husband for ten years and since lived a chaste life. At this age, however, she became subject to violent crises of sexual orgasm which would come on without any accompaniment of voluptuous thoughts. McGillicuddy records three cases of spontaneous orgasms in women coming under his notice. Such crises are frequently found in both men and women who, from moral reasons, ignorance or on other grounds, are restrained from attaining the complete sexual orgasm, but whose sexual emotions are literally continually dribbling from them. Schrenk Nürzisch knows a lady who is spontaneously sexually excited on hearing music or seeing pictures without anything lascivious in them. She knows nothing of sexual relationships. Another lady is sexually excited on seeing beautiful and natural scenes like the sea. Sexual ideas are mixed up in her mind with these things, and the contemplation of a specially strong and sympathetic man brings the orgasm on in about a minute. Both these ladies masturbate in the streets, restaurants, railways, theatres, without anyone perceiving it. A Brahmin woman informed a medical correspondent in India that she had distinct though feeble orgasm with copious outflow of mucus if she stayed long near a man whose face she liked, and this is not uncommon among European women. Evidently, under such conditions, there is a state of hyperesthetic weakness. Here, however, we are passing the frontiers of strictly autoerotic phenomena. Delectatio morosa, as understood by the theologians, is distinct from desire, and also distinct from the definite intention of effecting the sexual act, although it may lead to those things. It is a voluntary and complacent dallying in imagination with voluptuous thoughts, when no effort is made to repel them. It is, as Aquinas and others point out, constituted by this act of complacent dallying and has no reference to the duration of the imaginative process. Debrin, in his Machiology, deals fully with this question and quotes the opinions of theologians. I may add that in the early penitentials, 
Before the elaboration of Catholic theology, the voluntary emission of semen through the influence of evil thought was recognized as a sin, though usually only if it occurred in church. In Egbert's penitential of the 8th or 9th century, the penance assigned for this offense in the case of a deacon is 25 days, in the case of a monk, 30 days, a priest, 40 days, a bishop, 50. The frequency of spontaneous orgasm in women seems to have been recognized in the 17th century. Thus, Schurig, apparently quoting Riolin, states that some women are so wanton that the sight of a handsome man or of their lover or speech with such a one will cause them to ejaculate their semen. There is, however, a closely allied and indeed overlapping form of autoerotism which may be considered here. I mean that associated with reverie or daydreaming. Although this is a very common and important form of autoerotism, besides being in a large proportion of cases the early stage of masturbation, it appears to have attracted little attention. The daydream has indeed been studied in its chief form in the continued story by Mabel Leroyd of Wesley College. The continued story is an imagined narrative more or less peculiar to the individual by whom it is cherished with fondness and regarded as an especially sacred mental possession to be shared only, if at all, with very sympathizing friends. It is commoner among girls and young women than among boys and young men. Among 352% of both sexes, 47% among the women and only 14% among the men have any continued story. The starting point is an incident from a book or more usually from actual experience which the subject develops. The subject is nearly always the hero or the heroine of the story. The growth of the story is favored by solitude and lying in bed before going to sleep is a time specially sacred to its cultivation. No distinct reference, perhaps naturally enough, is made by Ms. Learoyd to the element of sexual emotion with which these stories are often strongly tinged and which is frequently their real motive. Though by no means easy to detect, these elaborate and more or less erotic daydreams are not uncommon in young men and especially in young women. Each individual has his own particular dream, which is always varying or developing but except in very imaginative persons, to no great extent. Such a daydream is often founded on a basis of pleasurable personal experience and develops on that basis. It may evolve an element of perversity even though that element finds no expression in real life. It is, of course, fostered by sexual abstinence, hence its frequency in young women. Most usually there is little attempt to realize it. It does not necessarily lead to masturbation, though it often causes some sexual congestion or even spontaneous sexual orgasm. The daydream is a strictly private and intimate experience, not only from its very nature, but also because it occurs in images which the subject finds great difficulty in translating into language, even when willing to do so. In other cases, it is elaborately dramatic or romantic in character. The hero or heroine passes through many experiences before attaining the erotic climax of the story. This climax tends to develop in harmony with the subject's growing knowledge or experience. At first merely a kiss, it may develop into any refinement of voluptuous gratification. The daydream may occur either in normal or abnormal persons. Rousseau, in his Confessions, describes such dreams, in his case combined with masochism and masturbation. A distinguished American novelist, Hamlin Garland, has admirably described in Rose of Duchess Cooley the part played in the erotic daydreams of a healthy normal girl at adolescence by a circus rider seen on the first visit to a circus and becoming a majestic ideal to dominate the girl's thoughts for many years.
Rafalovich describes a process by which insexual inverts the vision of a person of the same sex, perhaps seen in the streets or the theater, is evoked in solitary reveries, producing a kind of psychic onanism, whether or not it leads to physical manifestations. Although daydreaming of this kind has at present been very little studied, since it loves solitude and secrecy, has never been counted of sufficient interest for scientific inquisition. It is really a process of considerable importance and occupies a large part of the autoerotic field. It is frequently cultivated by refined and imaginative young men and women who lead a chaste life and would often be repelled by masturbation. In such persons, under such circumstances, it must be considered as strictly normal the inevitable outcome of the play of the sexual impulse. No doubt, it may often become morbid and is never a healthy process when indulged in to excess, as it is liable to be by refined young people with artistic impulses, to whom it is in the highest degree seductive and insidious. As we have seen, however, daydreaming is far from always colored by sexual emotion. Yet, it is a significant indication of its really sexual origin that, as I have been informed by persons of both sexes, even in these apparently non-sexual cases, it frequently ceases altogether on marriage. Even when we have eliminated all these forms of autoerotic activity, however refined, in which the subject takes a voluntary part, we have still left unexplored an important portion of the autoerotic field a portion which many people are alone inclined to consider normal, sexual orgasm during sleep, that under conditions of sexual abstinence in healthy individuals, there must inevitably be some autoerotic manifestations during waking life, a careful study of the facts compels us to believe. There can be no doubt also that under the same conditions, the occurrence of the complete orgasm during sleep with, in men, Seminal emissions is altogether normal. Even Zeus himself, as Pausanias has recorded, was liable to such accidents, a statement which, at all events, shows that to the Greek mind there was nothing derogatory in such an occurrence. The Jews, however, regarded it as an impurity, and the same idea was transmitted to the Christian church and embodied in the word pollutio, by which the phenomenon was designated in ecclesiastical phraseology. According to Billuard and other theologians, pollution in sleep is not sin, unless voluntarily caused. If, however, it begins in sleep and is completed in the half-waking state with a sensation of pleasure, it is a venial sin. But it seems allowable to permit a nocturnal pollution to complete itself an awakening if it occurs without intention. And St. Thomas even says, Si pollutio placiat ut nature exoneratio vel alleviatio pectum non creditor. Notwithstanding the fair and logical position of the more distinguished Latin theologians, there has certainly been a widely prevalent belief in Catholic countries that pollution during sleep is a sin. In the Parson's Tale, Chaucer makes the Parson say, Another sin appertaineth to lechery that cometh in sleeping, and the sin cometh oft to them that be maidens, and eke to them that be corrupt. And this sin men cleep pollution that cometh in four manners, these four manners being, number one, languishing of body from rank and abundant humours, number two, infirmity, three, surfeit of meat and drink, Four, villainous thoughts. Four hundred years later, Madame Roland, in her memoirs particular, presented a vivid picture of the anguish produced in an innocent girl's mind by the notion of the sinfulness of erotic dreams. She menstruated first at the age of fourteen. Before this, she writes, I had sometimes been awakened from the deepest sleep in a surprising manner. Imagination played no part. I exercised it on too many serious subjects, and my timorous conscience preserved it from amusement with other subjects. 
so that it could not represent what I would not allow it to seek to understand. But an extraordinary effervescence aroused my senses in the heat of repose, and by virtue of my excellent constitution, operated by itself, a purification which was as strange to me as its cause. The first feeling which resulted was, I know not why, a sort of fear. I had observed in my fealty that we are not allowed to obtain any pleasure from our bodies except in lawful marriage. What I had experienced could be called a pleasure. I was then guilty, and in a class of offences which caused me the most shame and sorrow, since it was that which was most displeasing to the spotless lamb. There was great agitation in my poor heart, prayers and mortifications. How could I avoid it? for indeed I had not foreseen it, but at the instant when I experienced it, I had not taken the trouble to prevent it. My watchfulness became extreme. I scrupulously avoided positions which I found specially exposed me to the accident. My restlessness became so great that at last I was able to awake before the catastrophe. When I was not in time to prevent it, I would jump out of bed with naked feet onto the polished floor and with crossed arms pray to the Saviour to preserve me from the wiles of the devil. I would then impose some penance on myself, and I have carried out to the letter what the prophet king probably only transmitted to us as a figure of oriental speech, mixing ashes with my bread and watering it with my tears. End of Autoeroticism, Part 1, Section 2《Auto Eroticism》A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse Part 1 Section 3 Of Studies in the Psychology of Sex Volume 1 by Havelock Ellis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Auto Eroticism a Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse Part 1, Section 3 To the early Protestant mind, as illustrated by Luther, there was something diseased, though not impure, in sexual excitement during sleep. Thus, in a stable talk, Luther remarks that girls who have such dreams should be married at once, taking the medicine which God has given. It is only of comparatively recent years that medical science has obtained currency for the belief that this autoerotic process is entirely normal. Blumenbach stated that nocturnal emissions are normal. Sir James Paget declared that he had never known celibate men who had not such emissions from once or twice a week to twice every three months, both extremes being within the limits of good health while Sir Lord of Brunton considers once a fortnight or once a month about the usual frequency. At these periods, the emissions often following two nights in succession. Rolder believes that they may normally follow for several nights in succession. Hammond considers that they occur about once a fortnight. Ribbing regards 10 to 14 days as a normal interval. Lowenfeld puts the normal frequency at about once a week. This seems to be nearer the truth as regards most fairly healthy young men. In proof of this, it is only necessary to refer to the exact records of healthy young adults summarized in the study of periodicity in the present volume. It occasionally happens, however, that nocturnal emissions are entirely absent. I am acquainted with some cases. In other fairly healthy young men, they seldom occur except at times of intellectual activity or of anxiety and worry. Lately there has been some tendency for medical opinion to revert to the view of Luther and to regard sexual excitement during sleep as a somewhat unhealthy phenomenon. Moll is a distinguished advocate of this view. Sexual excitement during sleep is a normal result of celibacy. But it is another thing to say that it is, on that account, satisfactory. 
we might then, Moll remarks, maintain that nocturnal incontinence of urine is satisfactory, since the bladder is thus emptied. Yet, we take every precaution against this by insisting that the bladder shall be emptied before going to sleep. This remark is supported by the fact to which I find that both men and women can bear witness that sexual excitement during sleep is more fatiguing than in the waking state, though this is not an invariable rule and it is sometimes found to be refreshing. In a similar way, Eulenburg states that nocturnal emissions are no more normal than coughing or vomiting. Nocturnal emissions are usually, though not invariably, accompanied by dreams of a voluptuous character in which the dreamer becomes conscious in a more or less fantastic manner of the more or less intimate presence or contact of a person of the opposite sex. It would seem, as a general rule, that the more vivid and voluptuous a dream, the greater is a physical excitement, and the greater also the relief experienced on awakening. Sometimes the erotic dream occurs without any emission, and not infrequently, the emission takes place after the dreamer has awakened. The widest and most comprehensive investigation of erotic dreams is that carried out by Gualino in northern Italy, and based on inquiries among hundred normal men, doctors, teachers, lawyers, etc., who had all had experience of the phenomenon. Gualino shows that erotic dreams with emissions, whether or not seminal, began somewhat earlier than the period of physical development as ascertained by Maro for youths of the same part of northern Italy. Gualino found that all his cases had had erotic dreams at the age of 17. Maro found 8% of youths still sexually underdeveloped at that age. And while sexual development began at 13 years, erotic dreams began at 12. Their appearance was preceded, in most cases for some months, by erections. In 37% of the cases, there had been no actual sexual experiences, either masturbation or intercourse. In 23%, there had been masturbation. In the rest, some form of sexual contact. The dreams are mainly visual, tactual elements coming second and the dramatis persona is either an unknown woman or only known by sight, and in the majority is, at all events in the beginning, an ugly or fantastic figure, becoming more attractive later in life, but never identical with the woman loved during waking life. This, as Guvalino points out, accords with the general tendency for the emotions of the day to be latent in sleep, Masturbation only formed the subject of the dream in four cases. The emotional state in the pubertal stage, apart from pleasure, was 37% anxiety, 17% desire, 14% fear. In the adult stage, anxiety and fear receded to 7% and 6% respectively. 33 of the subjects as a result of sexual or general disturbances had had nocturnal emissions without dreams. These were always found exhausting. Normally, erotic dreams are the most vivid of all dreams. In no case was there knowledge of any monthly or other cyclic periodicity in the occurrence of the manifestations. In 34% of cases, they tended to occur very soon after sexual intercourse. In numerous cases, they were peculiarly frequent during courtship, when the young man was in the habit of kissing and caressing his betrothed, but ceased after marriage. It was not noted that possession in bed or a full bladder exerted any marked influence in the occurrence of erotic dreams. Repletion of the seminal vesicles is regarded as a main factor. In Germany, erotic dreams have been discussed by Volkel, and especially by Lowenfeld while in America, Stanley Hall thus summarizes the general characteristics of erotic dreams in men. In by far the most cases, consciousness, even when the act causes full awakening from sleep, finds only scattered images, single words, gestures and acts, 
many of which would perhaps normally constitute no provocation. Many times the mental activity seems to be remote and incidental, and the mind retains in the morning nothing except perhaps a peculiar dress pattern, the shape of a fingernail, the back of a neck, the toss of a head, the movement of a foot, or the dressing of the hair. In such cases, these images stand out for a time with the distinctness of a cameo and suggest that the origin of erotic fetishisms is largely to be found in sexual dreams. Very rarely is there any imagery of the organs themselves, but the tendency to irradiation is so strong as to reinforce the suggestion of so many other phenomena in this field that nature designs this experience to be long-circuited and that it may give a peculiar ictus to almost any experience. When waking occurs just afterward, it seems at least possible that they may be much imagery that existed but fail to be recalled to memory, possibly because the flow of psychic impressions was over very familiar fields and this, therefore, was forgotten while any eruption into new or unwanted channels stood out with distinctness. All these psychic phenomena, although very characteristic of man in his prime, are not so of the dreams of dawning puberty, which are far more vivid. I may further quote the experience of an anonymous contributor, a healthy and chaste man between 30 and 38 years of age, to the American Journal of Psychology. Legs and breasts often figured prominently in these dreams, the other sexual parts, however, very seldom, and then they turned out to be male organs in most cases. There were but two instances of copulation dreamt. Girls and young women were the usual dramatis personae, and curiously enough, often the aggressors. Sometimes the face or faces were well known, sometimes only once seen, sometimes entirely unknown. The orgasm occurs at the most erotic part of the dream, the physical and psychical running parallel. This most erotic or suggestive part of the dream was very often quite an innocent-looking incident enough. As for example, while passing a strange young woman overtaken on the street, she calls after me some question. At first, I pay no heed, but when she calls again, I hesitate whether to turn back and answer or not. Emission. Again, walking beside a young woman, she said, Shall I take your arm? I offered and she took it, entwining her arm around it and raising it high. Emission. I could feel stronger erection as she asked the question. Sometimes a word was enough, sometimes a gesture. Once, emission took place on my noticing the young woman's diminished fingernails. Another example of fetishism was my being curiously attracted in a dream with the pretty embroidered figure on a little girl's dress. As an illustration of the strange metamorphoses that occur in dreams, I, one night, in my dream, fell in love with a partridge, which changed under my caresses to a beautiful girl who yet retained an indescribable wild bird innocence, grace and charm, a sort of undina. These experiences may be regarded as fairly typical of the erotic dreams of healthy and chaste young men. The bird, for instance, that changes into a woman while retaining some elements of the bird, has been encountered in erotic dreams by other young men. It is indeed remarkable that, as de Gibertinus observes, the bird is a well-known phallic symbol. While Medo finds that birds have a sexual significance, both in life and in dreams. The appearance of male organs in the dream woman is doubtless due to the dreamer's greater familiarity with those organs. But though it occurs occasionally, it can scarcely be said to be the rule in erotic dreams. Even men who have never had connection with a woman are quite commonly aware of the presence of a woman's sexual organs in the erotic dreams. Maul's comparison of nocturnal emissions of semen with nocturnal incontinence of urine 
suggests an interesting resemblance, and at the same time seeming contrast. In both cases, we are concerned with viscera which, when overfilled or unduly irritable, spasmodically eject their contents during sleep. There is a further resemblance which usually becomes clear when, as occasionally happens, nocturnal incontinence of urine persists on to late childhood or adolescence. Both phenomena are frequently accompanied by vivid dreams of appropriate character. Thus, in one case known to me, a child of seven who occasionally wet up the bed usually dreamed at the same time that she wanted to make water and was out of doors, running to find a suitable spot, which she at last found, and on awakening discovered that she had wetted the bed. Fifteen years later, she still sometimes had similar dreams, which caused her much alarm until, when thoroughly awake, she realized that no accident had happened. These later dreams were not the result of any strong desire to urinate. In another case with which I am acquainted, a little girl of eight, after mental excitement or indigestible meals, occasionally wetted the bed, dreaming that she was frightened by someone running after her, and wetted herself in consequence. After the manner of the Ganymede and Eagle's Clutch, as depicted by Rembrandt. These two cases, it may be noted, belong to two quite different types. In the first case, the full bladder suggests to imagination the appropriate actions for relief, and the bladder actually accepts the imaginative solution offered. It is, according to Fiorani's phrase, somnambulism of the bladder. In the other case, there is no such somnambulism, but a psychic and nervous disturbance not arising in the bladder at all, it radiates convulsively and whether or not the bladder is overfull, attacks a vesicle nervous system which is not yet sufficiently well balanced to withstand the inflow of excitement. In children of somewhat nervous temperament, manifestations of this kind may occur as an occasional accident up to about the age of seven or eight, and thereafter the nervous control of the bladder Having become firmly established, they cease to happen, the nervous energy required to affect the bladder, sufficing to wake the dreamer. In very rare cases, however, the phenomenon may still occasionally happen, even in adolescence or later, in individuals who are otherwise quite free from it. This is most apt to occur in young women, even in waking life. In men, it is probably extremely rare. The erotic dream seems to differ flagrantly from the vesicle dream in that it occurs in adult life and is with difficulty brought under control. The contrast is, however, very superficial. When we remember that sexual activity only begins normally at puberty, we realize that the youth of twenty is, in the matter of sexual control, scarcely much older than in the matter of vesicle control he was at the age of six. Moreover, if we were habitually, from our earliest years, to go to bed with a full bladder, as a chaste man goes to bed with unrelieved sexual system, it would be fully as difficult to gain vesicle control during sleep as it now is to gain sexual control. Ultimately, such sexual control is attained. After the age of 40, it seems that erotic dreams with emission become more and more rare. Either the dream occurs without actual emission, exactly as dreams of urination occur in adults with full bladder, or else the organic stress, with or without dreams, serves to awaken the sleeper before any emission has occurred. But this stage is not easily or completely attained. St. Augustine, even in the period when he wrote his Confessions, mentions as a matter of course that sexual dreams not merely arouse pleasure, but gain the consent of the will. Not infrequently, there is a struggle in sleep, just as the hypnotic subject may resist suggestions. Thus, a lady of 35 dreamed a sexual dream, and awoke without excitement. Again she fell asleep, and had another dream of sexual character, but resisted the tendency to excitement, and again awoke. Finally, she fell asleep and had a third sexual dream, 
which was this time accompanied by the orgasm. The factors involved in the acquirement of vesicle and sexual control during sleep are the same, but the conditions are somewhat different. There is a very intimate connection between the vesicle and the sexual spheres, as I have elsewhere pointed out. This connection is psychic as well as organic. Both in men and women, a full bladder tends to develop erotic dreams. Raymond and Janet state that nocturnal incontinence of urine, accompanied by dreams of urination, may be replaced at puberty by masturbation. In the reverse direction, Freud believes that masturbation plays a large part in causing the bedwetting of children who have passed the age when that usually ceases and he even finds that children are themselves aware of the connection. The diagnostic value of sexual dreams as an indication of the sexual nature of the subject when awake has been emphasized by various writers. Sexual dreams tend to reproduce and even to accentuate those characteristics which make the strongest sexual appeal to the subject when awake. At the same time, this general statement has to be qualified more especially as regards inverted dreams. In the first place, a young man, however normal, who is not familiar with the feminine body when awake, is not likely to see it when asleep, even in dreams of women. In the second place, the confusions and combinations of dream imagery often tend to obliterate sexual distinctions, however free from perversions the subjects may be. Thus, a correspondent tells me of a healthy man of very pure character, totally inexperienced in sexual matters, and never having seen a woman naked who, in her sexual dreams, always sees a woman with male organs, though he has never had any sexual inclinations for men and is much in love with a lady. The confusions and associations of dream imagery leading to abnormal combinations may be illustrated by a dream which once occurred to me after reading Joist's account of how a young negress, whose tattoo marks he was sketching, having become bored, suddenly pressed her hands to her breast, spurting two streams of lukewarm milk into his face, and ran away laughing. I dreamed of a woman performing a similar action, not from her breast, however, but from a penis with which she was furnished. Again, by another kind of confusion, a man dreams sexually that he is with a man, although the figure of the partner revealed in the dream is a woman. The following dream in a normal man who had never been or wished to be in the position shown by the dream may be quoted. I dreamed that I was a big boy and that a younger boy lay close beside me and that we, or certainly he, had seminal emissions. I was complacently passive and had a feeling of shame when the boy was discovered. On awaking, I found I had no emission, but I was lying very close to my wife. The day before, I had seen boys in a swimming match. This was, it seems to me, an example of dream confusion, and not an erotic inverted dream. End of Autoeroticism, Part 1, Section 3「Autoeroticism – A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse, Part 1, Section 4, of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by J. C. Guan. Autoeroticism – a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse part one section four so far as i have been able to ascertain there seems to be generally speaking certain differences in the manifestations of autoerotism during sleep in men and women which i believe to be not without psychological significance in men the phenomenon is fairly simple it usually appears about puberty continues at intervals of varying duration during sexual life, provided the individual is living chastely, and is generally, though not always, accompanied by erotic dreams which lead up to the climax, its occurrence being, to some extent, influenced by a variety of circumstances, physical, mental, or emotional excitement, 
alcohol taken before retiring, position in bed, as lying on the back, the state of the bladder, sometimes the mere fact of being in a strange bed, and, to some extent, apparently by the existence of monthly and yearly rhythms. On the whole, it is a fairly definite and regular phenomenon, which usually leaves little conscious trace on awaking, beyond probably some sense of fatigue and occasionally a headache. In women, however, the phenomena of autoerotism during sleep seem to be much more irregular, varied, and diffused. So far as I have been able to make inquiries, it is the exception rather than the rule for girls to experience definitely erotic dreams about the period of puberty or adolescence. Autoerotic phenomena during sleep in women who have never experienced the orgasm when awake are usually of a very vague kind. While it is the rule in a chaste youth for the orgasm thus to manifest itself, it is the exception in a chaste girl. It is not, as a rule, until the orgasm has been definitely produced in the waking state, under whatever conditions it may have been produced, that it begins to occur during sleep, and even in a strongly sexual woman living a repressed life, it is often comparatively infrequent. Thus a young medical woman, who endeavors to deal strenuously with her physical sexual emotions, writes, I sleep soundly, and do not dream at all. Occasionally, but very rarely, I have had sensations which awakens me suddenly. They can scarcely be called dreams, for they are mere impulses, nothing connected or coherent, yet prompted, I know, by sexual feeling. This is probably an experience common to all. Another lady, with a restrained psychosexual tendency to be attracted to both sexes, states that her first sexual sensations with orgasm were felt in dreams at the age of sixteen, but these dreams, which she has now forgotten, were not agreeable and not erotic. Two or three years later, spontaneous orgasm began to occur occasionally when awake, and after this, orgasm took place regularly once or twice a week in sleep, but still without erotic dreams. She merely dreamt that the orgasm was occurring, and awoke as it took place. It is possible that to the comparative rarity in chaste women of complete orgasm during sleep, we may in part attribute the violence with which repressed sexual emotion in women often manifests itself. There is thus a difference, here, between men and women, which is of some significance when we are considering the natural satisfaction of the sexual impulse in chaste women. In women, who have become accustomed to sexual intercourse, erotic dreams of fully developed character occur, with complete orgasm and accompanying relief as may occasionally be the case in women who are not acquainted with actual intercourse. Some women, however, even when familiar with actual coitus, find that sexual dreams, though accompanied by emissions, are only the symptoms of desire, and do not produce actual relief. Some interest attaches to cases in which young women, even girls at puberty, experience dreams of erotic character, or at all events dreams considering coitus or men in erection, although they profess, and almost certainly with truth, to be quite ignorant of sexual phenomena. Several such dreams of remarkable character have been communicated to me. One can imagine that the psychologists of some schools would see in these dreams the spontaneous eruption of the experiences of the race. I am inclined to regard them as forgotten memories, such as we know to occur sometimes in sleep. The child has somehow seen or heard of sexual phenomena, and felt no interest, and the memory may subsequently be aroused in sleep, under the stimulation of newborn sexual sensations. It is a curious proof of the ignorance which has prevailed in the recent times concerning the psychic sexual nature of women that, although in earlier ages the fact that women are normally liable, to erotic dreams was fully recognized, in recent times it has been denied even by writers who have made a special study of the sexual impulse in women. Eulenburg, Sexuale Neuropathie, 1895, pages 31 and 79, appears to regard the appearances of sexual phenomena during sleep in women as the result of masturbation. Adler, in what is, in many respects, an extremely careful study of sexual phenomena in women, Die mangelhafte Geschlechtsempfindung des Weibes, 
1904, page 130, boldly states that they do not have erotic dreams. In 1847, E. Guibou, Des pollutions involontaires de la femme, Union médicale, page 260, presented the case of a married lady who masturbated from the age of ten and continued the practice, even after her marriage at twenty-four, and at twenty-nine began to have erotic dreams with emissions every night, and later sometimes even several times a night, though they ceased to be voluptuous. He believed the case to be the first ever reported of such a condition in a woman. Yet, thousands of years ago, the Indian of Vedic days recognized erotic dreams in women as an ordinary and normal occurrence. Lohenfeld quotes a passage to this effect from the Upnekat, Sexualleben und Nervenleiden, 2nd edition, page 114. Even savages recognized the occurrence of erotic dreams in women as normal. For the Papuans, for instance, believe that a young girl's first menstruation is due to intercourse with the moon in the shape of a man the girl dreaming that a man is embracing her. Reports, Cambridge Expedition to Torres Straits, Volume 5, page 206. In the 17th century, Rolf Finches, in a well-informed study, De Pollucione Nocturna, a Jena inaugural dissertation, 1667, concluded that women experience such manifestations, and quotes Aristotle, Galen, and Fernelius in the same sense. Sir Thomas Overbury, in his characters, written in the early part of the same century, describing the ideal milkmaid, says that her dreams are so chaste that she dare tell them, clearly implying that it was not so with most women. The notion that women are not subject to erotic dreams thus appears to be of comparatively recent origin. One of the most interesting and important characters by which the erotic dreams of women and indeed their dreams generally, differ from those of men, is in the tendency to evoke a repercussion on the waking life, a tendency more rarely noted in men's erotic dreams, and then only to a minor extent. This is a very common, even in healthy and normal women, and is exaggerated to a high degree in neurotic subjects, by whom the dream may even be interpreted as a reality, and so declared on oath a fact of practical importance. Hersman, having met with a case in which a schoolgirl with Korea, after having dreamed of an assault, accused the principal of a school of assault, securing his conviction, obtained the opinions of various American alienists as to the frequency with which such dreams in unstable mental subjects lead to delusions and criminal accusations. Durkham, H. C. Wood, and Rohe had not personally met with such cases. Burr believed that there was strong evidence that sexual dream may be so vivid as to make the subject believe she has had sexual congress. Kiernan knew of such cases. C. H. Hughes, in persons with every appearance of sanity, had known the erotic dreams of the night to become the erotic delusions of the day, the patient protesting violently the truth of her story, while Hersman reports the case of a young lady in an asylum who had nightly delusions that a medical officer visited her every night, and had to do with her. Coming up, the hot air flew. I am acquainted with a similar case in a clever but highly neurotic young woman, who writes, For years I have been trying to stamp out my passional nature, and was beginning to succeed when a strange thing happened to me last autumn. One night, as I lay in bed, I felt an influence so powerful that a man seemed present with me. I crimsoned with shame and wonder. I remembered that I lay upon my back and marveled when the spell had passed. The influence, I was assured, came from a priest whom I believed in and admired above every one in the world. I had never dreamed of love in connection with him, because I always thought him so far above me. The influence has been upon me ever since sometimes by day, and nearly always by night. From it I generally go into a deep sleep, which lasts until morning. I am always much refreshed when I awake. This influence has the best effect upon my life that anything has ever had as regards health and mind. It is the knowledge that I am loved fittingly that makes me so indifferent to my future. What worries me is that I sometimes wonder if I suffer from a nervous disorder merely. 
the subject thus seemed to regard these occurrences as objectively caused, but was sufficiently sane to wonder whether her experiences were not due to mental disorder. The tendency of the autoerotic phenomena of sleep to be manifested with such energy as to flow over into the waking life and influence conscious emotion and action, while very well marked in normal and healthy women, is seen to an exaggerated extent in hysterical women, in whom it has, therefore, chiefly been studied. Sante de Sanctis, who has investigated the dreams of many classes of people, remarks on the frequently sexual character of the dreams of hysterical women, and the repercussion of such dreams on the waking life of the following day. He gives a typical case of hysterical erotic dreaming in an uneducated servant girl of twenty-three, in whom such dreams occur usually a few days before the menstrual period. Her dreams, especially if erotic, make an enormous impression on her. In the morning she is bad-tempered if they were unpleasant, whilst she feels lascivious and gives herself up to masturbation if she has had erotic dreams of men. She then has a feeling of pleasure throughout the day, and her sexual organs are bathed with moisture. Pitre and Gilles de la Tourette, two of Charcot's most distinguished pupils, in their elaborate works on hysteria, both consider that dreams generally have a great influence on the waking life of the hysterical, and they deal with the special influence of erotic dreams, to which, doubtless, we must refer those conceptions of incubi and succubi, which played so vast and so important a part in the demonology of the Middle Ages, and while not unknown in men, were most frequent in women. Such erotic dreams, as these observers, conferring the experience of old writers, have found among the hysterical today, are by no means always, or even usually, of a pleasurable character. It is very rare, Petra remarks, when insisting on the sexual character of the hallucinations of the hysterical, for these erotic hallucinations to be accompanied by agreeable voluptuous sensations. In most cases, the illusion of sexual intercourse even provokes acute pain. The witches of old times nearly all affirmed that in their relations with the devil they suffered greatly. They said that his organ was long and rough and pointed, with scales which lifted on withdrawal and tore the vagina. It seems probable, I may remark, that the witches' representations, both of the devil and of sexual intercourse, were largely influenced by familiarity with the coupling of animals. As Gilles de la Tourette is careful to warn his readers, we must not too hastily resume, from the prevalence of nocturnal autoerotic phenomena in hysterical women, that such women are necessarily sexual and libidinous in excess. The disorder is in them psychic, he points out, and not physical, and they usually receive sexual approaches with indifference and repugnance, because their sexual centers are anesthetic or hyperesthetic. During the period of sexual activity, they seek much more the care and delicate attention of men than the genital act, which they often only tolerate. Many households begun under the happiest auspices, the bride all the more apt to believe that she loves her betrothed in virtue of her suggestibility, easily exalted, perhaps at the expense of the senses, become hells on earth. The sexual act has for the hysterical woman more than one disillusion. She cannot understand it. It inspires her with insurmountable repugnance. I refer to these hysterical phenomena because they present to us, in an extreme form, facts which are common among women whom, under the artificial conditions of civilized life, we are compelled to regard as ordinarily healthy and normal. The frequent painfulness of autoerotic phenomena is by no means an exclusive hysterical phenomenon, although often seen in a heightened form in hysterical conditions. It is probably to some extent simply the result of a conflict in consciousness with a mere physical impulse which is strong enough to assert itself in spite of the emotional and intellectual abhorrence of the subject. It is thus but an extreme form of the disgust which all sexual physical manifestations tend to inspire in a person who is not inclined to respond to them. Somewhat similar psychic disgust and physical pain are produced in the attempts to stimulate the sexual emotions and organs when these are exhausted by exercise. 
in the detailed history which Mole presents of the sexual experiences of a sister in an American nursing guild, a most instructive history of a woman fairly normal except for the results of repressed sexual emotion, and with strong moral tendencies. Various episodes are narrated well, illustrating the way in which sexual excitement becomes unpleasant or even painful when it takes place as a physical reflex which the emotions and intellect are all at the time struggling against. It is quite probable, however, that there is a psychological as well as a psychic factor in this phenomenon, and Solier, in his elaborate study of the nature and genesis of hysteria, by insisting on the capital importance of the disturbance of sensibility in hysteria, and the definite character of the phenomena produced in the passage between anesthesia and normal sensation, has greatly helped to reveal the mechanism of this feature of autoerotic excitement in the hysterical. No doubt, there has been a tendency to exaggerate the unpleasant character of the autoerotic phenomena of hysteria. That tendency was an inevitable reaction against an earlier view, according to which hysteria was little more than an unconscious expression of the sexual emotions, and as such was unscientifically dismissed without any careful investigation. I agree with Brewer and Freud that the sexual needs of the hysterical are just as individual and various as those of normal women, but that they suffer from them more, largely through a moral struggle with their own instincts, and the attempt to put them into the background of consciousness. In many hysterical and physically abnormal women, other erotic phenomena, and sexual phenomena generally, are highly pleasurable, though such persons may be quite innocent of any knowledge of the erotic character of the experience. I have come across interesting and extreme examples of this in the published experiences of the women followers of the American religious leader T. L. Harris, founder of the Brotherhood of the New Life. Thus, in a pamphlet entitled Internal Respiration by Respiro, a letter is quoted from a lady physician who writes, One morning I awoke with a strange new feeling in the womb, which lasted for a day or two. I was so very happy, but the joy was in my womb, not in my heart. At last, writes a lady quoted in the same pamphlet, I fell into a slumber, lying on my back with arms and feet folded, a position I almost always find myself in when I awake, no matter in which position I may go to sleep. Very soon I awoke from this slumber with a most delightful sensation, every fibre tingling with an exquisite glow of warmth. I was lying on my left side, something I am never able to do, and was folded in the arms of my counterpart. Unless you have seen it, I cannot give you an idea of the beauty of his flesh, and with what joy I beheld and felt it. Think of it, luminous flesh, and, oh, such tints, you never could imagine without seeing. He folded me so closely in his arms, etc. In such cases, there is no conflict between the physical and the psychic, and therefore the resulting excitement is pleasurable and not painful. At this point, our study of autoerotism brings us into the sphere of mysticism. Luba, in a penetrating and suggestive essay on Christian mysticism, after quoting the present study, refers to the famous passages in which St. Theresa describes how a beautiful little angel inserted a flint dart into her heart until it descended into her bowels and left her inflamed with divine love. What psychological difference, he asks, is there between this voluptuous sensation and that enjoyed by the disciple of the brotherhood of new life? St. Theresa says bowels, the woman doctor says womb, that is all. The extreme form of autoerotism is the tendency for the sexual emotion to be absorbed and often entirely lost in self-admiration. This narcissus-like tendency, of which the normal germ in women is symbolized by the mirror, is found in a mirror degree in some men, and is sometimes well marked in women, usually in association with an attraction for other persons, to which attraction it is, of course, normally subservient. The mirror remarks Bloch, Beträge, 1, page 201, plays an important part in the genesis of sexual aberration. 
it cannot be doubted that many a boy and girl have first experienced sexual excitement at the sight of their own bodies in the mirror. Valera, the Spanish novelist, very well described this impulse in his Guiño y Figura. Rafaela, the heroine of this novel, says that, after her bath, I fall into a puerility which may be innocent or vicious, I cannot decide. I only know that it is a purely contemplative act, a disinterested admiration of beauty. It is not coarse sensuality, but aesthetic platonism. I imitate Narcissus, and I apply my lips to the cold surface of the mirror and kiss my image. It is the love of beauty, the expression of tenderness and affection for what God has made manifest, in an ingenious kiss imprinted on the empty and incorporeal reflection. In the same spirit, the real heroine of the Tagebuch einer Verlorenen, page 114, at the point when she was about to become a prostitute, wrote, I am pretty. It gives me pleasure to throw off my clothes one by one before the mirror and to look at myself just as I am, white as snow and straight as a fur, with my long fine hair like a cloak of black silk. When I spread abroad the black stream of it with both hands, I am like a white swan with black wings. A typical case known to me is that of a lady of twenty-eight, brought up on a farm. She is a handsome woman, of very large and fine proportions, active and healthy and intelligent, with, however, no marked sexual attraction to the opposite sex. At that same time she is not inverted, though she would like to be a man and has a considerable degree of contempt for women. She has an intense admiration for her own person, especially her limbs. She is never so happy as when alone and naked in her own bedroom, and so far as possible she cultivates nakedness. She knows by heart the various measurements of her body, is proud of the fact that they are strictly in accordance with the canons of proportion, and she laughs proudly that her thigh is larger than many a woman's waist. She is frank and assured in her manners, without sexual shyness, and while willing to receive the attention and admiration of others, she makes no attempt to gain it, and seems never to have experienced any emotions stronger than her own pleasure in herself. I should add that I have had no opportunity of detailed examination, and cannot speak positively as to the absence of masturbation. In the extreme form in which alone the name of Narcissus may properly be invoked, there is comparative indifference to sexual intercourse or even the admiration of the opposite sex. Such a condition seems to be rare, except perhaps in insanity. Since I called attention to this form of autoerotism, Alienist and Neurologist, April 1898, several writers have discussed the condition, especially Nika, who, following out the suggestion, terms the condition narcissism. Among a thousand and five hundred insane persons, Nike has found it in four men and one woman. Psychiatrische und Neurologische Bladen, number 2, 1899. Dr. C. H. Hughes writes in a private letter that he is acquainted with such cases, in which men have been absorbed in admiration of their own manly forms, and of their sexual organs, and women, likewise, absorbed in admiration of their own mammae and physical proportions, especially of limbs. The whole subject, he adds, is a singular phase of psychology, and it is not at all morbid psychology, either. It is closely allied to that aesthetic sense which admires the nude in art. Ferré, L'Instant Sexuel, 2nd edition, page 271, mentions a woman who experienced sexual excitement in kissing her own hand. Necker knew a woman in an asylum who, during periodical fits of excitement, would kiss her own arms and hands, at the same time looking like a person in love. He also knew of a young man with dementia precox, who would kiss his own image. The Alcus by Geisteskranken. Allgemeine Zeitschrift für Psychiatrie, Band 63, page 127. Moll refers to a young homosexual lawyer who experienced great pleasure in gazing at himself in a mirror. Contraire sexualempfindung, third edition, page two twenty eight. 
and mentions another inverted man, an admirer of the nates of men, who, chancing to observe his own nates in a mirror, when changing his shirt, was struck by their beauty, and subsequently found pleasure in admiring them. Libido sexualis, bound one, thyle one, page sixty. Kaft Ebing knew a man who masturbated before a mirror, imagining at the same time how much better a real lover would be. The best observed cases of narcissism have, however, been recorded by Rolider, who confers upon this condition the ponderous name of automonosexualism, and believes that it has not been previously observed. H. Rolider, De Autonomo Sexualismus, being Heft 225 of Berliner Klinik, March 1907. In the two cases investigated by Rolder, both men, there was sexual excitement in the contemplation of the individual's own body, actually or in a mirror, with little or no sexual attraction to other persons. Rolider is inclined to regard the condition as due to a congenital defect in the sexual center of the brain. End of Autoeroticism, Part 1, Section 4《Autoeroticism》A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse Part 2, Section 1 Of Studies in the Psychology of Sex Volume 1 By Havelock Ellis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by O123 Autoeroticism A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the sexual impels part two section one the nocturnal hallucinations of hysteria as all careful students of this condition now seem to agree are closely allied to the hysterical attack proper solier indeed one of the amplest of the more recent investigators of hysteria has argued with much force that the subjects of hysteria really live in a state of pathological sleep of misillambulism he regards all the various accidents of hysteria as having a common basis in disturbances of sensibility in the widest sense of the word sensibility as the very foundation of personality while anesthesia is the real sensibility hysteria whatever the form of hysteria we are thus only concerned with a more or less profound state of visible a state in which the subject seems often even to himself to be more or less always asleep whether the sleep may be regarded as local or general. Solier agrees with Ferry that the disorder of sensibility may be regarded as due to an exertion of the sensory centers of the brain, whether as the result of constitutional cerebral weakness, of the shock of a violent emotion, or of some toxic influence on the cerebral cells. We may, therefore, fitly turn from the autoerotic phenomena of sleep, which in women generally, and especially in historical women, seem to possess so much importance and significance to the question which has been so diversely answered at different periods and by different investigators concerning the causation of hysteria and especially concerning its alleged connection with conscious or unconscious sexual emotion it was the belief of the ancient greeks that hysteria came from the womb hence its name we first find that, that statement in plato's Timaeus: in man the organ of generation becoming revelous and masterful, like an animal disobedient to reason, and maddened with the sting of lust, seeks to gain absolute sway. And the same is the case with the so-called womb or uterus of women. The animal within them is desirous of procreating children, and when remaining unfruitful long beyond its proper time, gets discontented and angry, and, wandering in every direction through the body, closes up the passages of the breath, and by obstructing respiration, drives them to extremity, causing all varieties of disease. Plato, it is true, cannot be said to reveal anywhere a very scientific attitude throughout nature. Yet, he has here probably only given expression to the current medical doctrine of his day. We find precisely the same doctrine attributed to Hippocrates, though without a clear distinction between hysteria and epilepsy. If we turn to the best Roman physicians, we find again that Editus, the squirrel of antiquity, has set forth the same view adding to his description of the movements of the womb in hysteria. It delights also in pregnant smells and advances toward them. 
and it has an aversion to fit its smells, and flies from them. And on the whole, the omb is like an animal within an animal. Consequently, the treatment was by applying fitted smells to the nose and rubbing fragrant ornaments around the sexual parts. The Arab physicians who carried on the traditions of Greek medicine appeared to have said nothing new about his study, and possibly had little knowledge of it. In Christian medieval Europe, also nothing new was added to the theory of history. It was indeed less known medically than it had ever been, and in part it may be as a result of this ignorance, in part as a result of general wretchedness, the historical phenomena of witchcraft reaching their height. Mitchell had points out, in the 14th century, which was a period of special misery for the poor, it flourished more vigorously. Not alone have we the records of nervous epidemics, but illuminated manuscripts, ivories, miniatures, boss reliefs, frescoes, and engravings furnish the most vivid iconographic evidence of the prevalence of hysteria in its most violent forms during the Middle Ages. Much of this evidence is brought to the service of science in the fascinating works of Dr. P. Riker, one of Jargon's pupils. In the 17th century, Ambroy Parry was still talking, like Hippocrates, about suffocation of the womb. Forestus was still, like Aretas, applying friction to the vulva. Farnell was still reproaching Galen, who had denied that the movements of the womb produced hysteria. It was in the 17th century, 1618, that a French physician, Charles Le Poy, Carolus Piso, physician to Henry II, trusting, as he said, to experience and reason, overthrew at one stroke the doctrine of hysteria that had ruled almost unquestioned for two thousand years, and showed that the malady occurred at all ages and in both sexes, that its seat was not in the womb but in the brain, and that it must be considered a nervous disease. So revolutionary a doctrine could not fail to meet with violent opposition, but it was confirmed by Willis, and in 1681 we owe to the genius of Sydenham. A picture of history was for lucidity, precision, and comprehensiveness has only been excelled in our own times. It was not possible any longer to maintain the oom theory of Hippocrates in its crude form, but in modified forms, and especially with the object of preserving the connection which many observers continued to find between hysteria and the sexual emotions. It still found supporters in the 18th and even the 19th centuries. James in the middle of the 18th century returned to the classical view, and in his Dictionary of Medicine maintained that the womb is the seat of hysteria. Lower Villermain in 1816 asserted that the most frequent causes of hysteria are deprivation of the pleasures of love, griefs connected with dispassion, and disorders of menstruation. Fauville in 1833 and Landosi in 1846 advocated somewhat similar views. The acute Laycock in 1840 quoted as almost a medical proverb the same, Salacitus Maser, Maser ad Hysterium Proclivitus, fully endorsing it. More recently, Steve Thurston has defined hysteria as the loss of the inhibitory influence exercised on the reproductive and sexual instincts of women by the higher mental and moral functions, a position evidently acquiring some modification in view of the fact that hysteria is by no means confined to women, while the same authority remarks that more or less constant sexual phenomena are the chief symptoms of hysterical insanity. Two gynecologists of high position in different parts of the world, Hager in Germany and Balls Headley in Australia, attribute hysteria as well as anemia, largely to unsatisfied sexual desire, including the non-satisfaction of the ideal feelings. Lambroso and Ferrero again, while admitting that the sexual feelings might be either heightened or depressed in hysteria, referring to the frequency of what they termed a paradoxical sexual instinct in the hysterical, by which, for instance, sexual frigidity is combined with intense sexual preoccupations. And they also pointed out the significant fact that the crimes of the hysterical nearly always revolve around the sexual sphere. Thus, even up to the time when the conception of hysteria which absolutely ignored and excluded any sexual relationship whatever had reached its height, Independent views favoring such a relationship still found expression. Of recent years, however, such views usually aroused violent antagonism. The main current of opinion was with Brickett, 1859, who, treating the matter with considerable ability and a wide induction of facts, indignantly repelled the idea that there is any connection between hysteria and the sexual facts of life, physical or psychic. As he himself admitted, Brickett was moved to deny a sexual causation of hysteria by the thought that 
such an origin would be degrading for women. A quelques jours de décadent pour les femmes. It was, however, the genius of Charcot and influence of his able pupils which finally secured the overthrow of the sexual theory of hysteria. Charcot empathetically anathematized the visceral origin of hysteria. He declared that it is a psychic disorder and to leave no loophole of escape for those who maintained a sexual causation. He asserted that there are no varieties of hysteria, that the disease is one and indivisible. Charcot recognized no primordial cause of hysteria beyond heredity, which here plays a more important part than in any other neuropathic condition. Such heredity is either direct or more occasionally by transformation, and the deviation of nutrition found in the ancestors, gout, diabetes, arthritis, being a possible cause of hysteria in the descendants. We do not know anything about the nature of hysteria. Charcot wrote in 1892. We must make it objective in order to recognize it. The dominant idea for us in the theology of hysteria is, in the widest sense, its hereditary predisposition. The greater number of those suffering from this affection are simply born hysterizables, and on them the occasional causes act directly, either through autosuggestion or by causing derangement of general nutrition, and more particularly of the nutrition of the nervous system. These views were ably and decisively stated in Zile de la Torre's Treaty de la Stadia, written under the inspiration of Jacob. While Jacob's doctrine was thus being affirmed and generally accepted, there were at the same time workers in these fields who, though they by no means ignored this doctrine of history or even rejected it, were included to think that it was too absolutely stated. Writing in the Dictionary of Psychological Medicine at the same time as Charcot, Donkin, while deprecating any exclusive emphasis on the sexual causation, pointed out the enormous part played by the emotions in the production of hysteria, and the great influence of puberty in women due to the greater extent of the sexual organs, and the consequently large area of central nourishing involved, and thus rendered liable to fall into a state of unstable equilibrium, and forced abstinence from the gratification of any of the inherent and primitive desires, he pointed out, may be an adequate exciting cause. Such a view as this indicated that to set aside the ancient doctrine of a physical sexual cause of hysteria was by no means to exclude a psychic sexual cause. Ten years earlier, Axenfield and Houchard pointed out that the reaction against the sexual origin of hysteria was becoming excessive, and their effort to the evidence brought forward by veterinary surgeons showing that unsatisfied sexual desire in animals may produce nervous symptoms very similar to hysteria. The present writer when in 1894, briefly discussing hysteria as an element in secondary sexual characterization, ventured to reflect a view, confirmed by his own observation, that there was a tendency to unduly minimize the sexual factor in hysteria, and further pointed out that the old error of a special connection between hysteria and the female sexual organs probably arose from the fact that, in women, the organic sexual sphere is larger than in man. When indeed we analyze the foundation of the once predominant opinions of Charcot and his school regarding the sexual relationships of hysteria, it becomes clear that many fallacies and misunderstandings were involved. Brickett, Charcot's sixth predecessor, acknowledged that his own view was that a sexual origin of hysteria would be degrading to him. That is to say, he admitted that he was influenced by a foolish and improper prejudice for the belief that the unconscious and involuntary morbid reactions of the nervous system to any disturbance of a great primary instinct can have, Kyoko shows that the Kadon is itself an immoral belief. Such disturbance of the nervous system might or might not be caused, but in any case the LS degradation could only be the fiction of a distorted imagination. Again, confusion had been caused by the ancient error of making the physical sexual organs responsible for hysteria. First, the womb. More recently, the ovaries. The outcome of this belief was the extirpation of the sexual organs for the cure of hysteria. Charcot contempt absolutely all such operations as unscientific and dangerous, declaring that there is no such thing as hysteria of menstrual origin. Subsequently, Angelusi and Pierasini carried out an international inquiry into the results of the surgical treatment of hysteria and condemned it in the most unqualified manner. It is clearly demonstrated that the physical sexual organs are not the seat of hysteria. It does not, however, follow that even physical sexual desire, when repressed, is not a cause of hysteria. The opinion that it was so formed an essential part of the early doctrine of hysteria, and was embodied in the ancient maxim, Nobat Illah, 
at Mahmoud's Fugiyat. The Umb, it seemed to the ancients, was crying out for satisfaction, and when that was received, the disease vanished. But when it became clear that sexual desire, though ultimately founded on the sexual apparatus, is a nervous and psychic fact, to put the sexual organs out of count was not sufficient, for the sexual emotions may exist before puberty, and persist after complete removal of the sexual organs. Thus it has been the object of many writers to repel the idea that unsatisfied sexual desire can be a cause of hysteria. Brickett pointed out that hysteria is rare among nuns and frequent among prostitutes. Croft have been believed that most hysterical women are not anxious for sexual satisfaction and declared that hysteria caused through the non-satisfaction of the coarse sensual sexual impulse I have never seen, while Petrus and others refer to the frequently painful nature of sexual hallucinations in the historical. But it soon becomes obvious that the psychic sexual sphere is not confined to the gratification of conscious physical sexual desire. It was not true that hysteria is rare among nuns. Some of the most tremendous epidemics of hysteria and the most carefully studied having occurred in convents, while the hysterical phenomena sometimes associated with revivals are well known. The supposed prevalence among prostitutes would not be evidence against the sexual relationships of hysteria. It has, however, been denied, even by so great an authority as parent de Tillet, who found it very rare, even in prostitutes in hospitals, when it was often associated with masturbation. In prostitutes, however, who returned to a respectable life, giving up their old habits, he found hysteria common and severe. The frequent absence of physical sexual feeling again may quite reasonably be taken as evidence of a disorder of the sexual emotions. While the undoubted fact that sexual intercourse usually has little beneficial effect on pronounced hysteria, and that sexual excitement during sleep and sexual hallucinations are often painful in the same condition, is far from showing that injury or repression of the sexual emotions had nothing to do with the production of hysteria. It would be as reasonable to argue that the evil effect of a heavy meal on a starving man must be taken as evidence that he was not suffering from starvation. The fact, indeed, on which Gilles de la Torre and others have remarked, that the hysterical often desire not so much sexual intercourse as simple affection, would tend to show that there is here a real analogy, and that starvation, or lesion of the sexual emotions, may produce, like bodily starvation, a rejection of those satisfactions which are demanded in health. Thus, even a mainly a prior examination of the matter may lead us to see that many arguments brought forward in favor of Charcot's position on this point fall to the ground when we realize that the sexual emotions may constitute a highly complex sphere, often hidden from observation, sometimes not conscious at all, and liable to many lesions besides that due to the non-satisfaction of sexual desire. At the same time, we are not thus enabled to overthrow any of the positive results attained by Charcot at his school. It may, however, be pointed out that Charcot's attitude towards hysteria was the outcome of his own temperament. He was primarily a neurologist. The bent of his genius was toward the investigation of facts that could be objectively demonstrated. His first interest in hysteria, dating from as far back as 1862, was in hysteroepileptic convulsive attacks, and to the last, he remained indifferent to all facts which could not be objectively demonstrated. That was the secret of the advances he was enabled to make in neurology. For purely psychological investigation, he had no liking and probably no aptitude. Anyone who was privileged to observe his methods of work at Salpetrini will easily recall the great master's towering figure. The disdainful expression, sometimes even it seemed a little sour. The lofty bearing, which enthusiastic admirers called Napoleonic. The questions addressed to the patient were cold, distant, sometimes impatient. Charcot clearly had little faith in the value of any results so attained. One may well believe also that a man whose superficial personality was so haughty and awe-inspiring to strangers would in any case have had the greatest difficulty in penetrating the mysteries of a psychic world so obscure and elusive as that presented by the hysterical. The way was thus opened for further investigations on the psychic side. Charcot had affirmed the power, not only of physical traumatism, but even of psychic lesions, of moral shocks, to provoke its manifestations. But his sole contribution to the psychology of this psychic malady, and this was borrowed from the Nancy School, lay in one word, suggestibility. The nature and mechanism of this psychic process 
he left wholly unexplained. This step has been taken by others, in part by Janet, who from 1889 onward has not only insisted that the emotions stand in the first line among the causes of hysteria, but also pointed out some portion of the mechanism of this process. Thus he saw the significance of the fact, already recognized, that strong emotions tend to produce anesthesia, and to lead to a condition of mental disaggregation, favorable to ebullia or evolution of will power. It remained to show in detail the mechanism by which the most potent of all the emotions affects its influence, and by attempting to do this, the Viennese investigators, Brewer and especially Freud, have greatly aided the study of hysteria. They have not, it is important to remark, overturned the positive elements in their great forerunner's work. Freud began as a disciple of Charcot, and he himself remarked that, in his earlier investigations of hysteria, he had no thought of finding any sexual etiology for that malady. He would have regarded any such suggestion as an insult to his patient. The results reached by these workers were the outcome of long and detailed investigation. Freud has investigated many cases of hysteria in minor detail often devoting to a single case over a hundred hours of work. The patients, unlike those on whom the results of the French school have been mainly founded, all belonged to the educated classes. And it was thus possible to carry out an elaborate psychic investigation, which would be impossible among the uneducated. Brewer and Freud insist on the fine qualities of mind and character frequently found among the hysterical. They cannot accept suggestibility as an invariable characteristic of hysteria only abnormal excitability. They are far from agreeing with Janet, although on many points at one with him, that psychic weakness marks hysteria. There is merely an appearance of mental weakness, they say, because the mental activity of the hysterical is split up, and only part of it is conscious. The superiority of character of the hysterical is indicated by the fact that the conflict between their ideas of right and the path of their inclinations is often an element in the constitution of the hysterical state. Brewer and Freud are prepared to assert that the historical are among the flower of humanity, and they refer to those qualities of combined imaginative genius and practical energy which characterized Saint Teresa, the patron saint of the historical. To understand the position of Brewer and Freud, we may start from the phenomena of nervous shock produced by physical traumatism, often of a very slight character. Charcot had shown that such nervous shock, with the chain of resulting symptoms, is nothing more or less than hysteria. Brewer and Freud may be linked on the charcoal at this point. They begin by regarding the most typical hysteria as really a psychic traumatism. That is to say that it starts in a lesion, or rather in repeated lesions, of emotional organism. It is true that the school of charcoal admitted the influence of moral shock, especially of the emotion of fear, but that merely as an agent provocative, and with a curious perversity, Gilebi Latore certainly reflecting the attitude of Charcot in his elaborate treatise on hysteria fails to refer to the sphere of the sexual emotions even when enumerating the agents provocators. The influence of fear is not denied by Brewer and Freud, but they have found that careful psychic analysis frequently shows that the shock of a commonplace fear is really rooted in a lesion of the sexual emotions. A typical and very simple illustration is furnished in a case recorded by Brewer in which a young girl of seventeen had her first historical attack after a cat sprang on her shoulders as she was going downstairs. Careful investigation showed that this girl had been the object of somewhat aberrant attentions from a young man whose advances she had resisted, although her own sexual emotions had been aroused. A few days before, she had been surprised by this young man on these same dark stairs and had forcibly escaped from his hands. Here was the real psychic traumatism the operation of which may only become manifest in the cat. But in how many cases, asks Brewer, is a cat does recount as a completely sufficient causa efficiens? In every case that they have investigated, Brewer and Freud have found some similar secret lesion of the psychic sexual sphere. In one case, a goddess, whose training has been severely upright, is, in spite of herself and without any encouragement, laid to experience for the father of the children under her care and affection which she refuses to acknowledge even to herself. In another, a young woman finds herself falling in love with her brother-in-law. Again, an innocent girl suddenly discovers her uncle in the act of sexual intercourse with her baby. And a boy on his way home from school is subjected to the coarse advances of a sexual involved. 
in nearly every case has for it eventually found reason to believe a primary relation of the sexual emotions dates from the period of puberty and frequently of childhood and in nearly every case the intimately private nature of the relation causes it to be carefully hidden from everyone and even to be unacknowledged by the subject of it in the earlier cases Breuer and freud found that a slight degree of hypnosis is necessary to bring the relation into consciousness and the accuracy of the revelations thus obtained has been tested by independent witness freud has however long abandoned the induction of any degree of hypnosis he simply tries to arrange that the patient shall feel absolutely free to tell her own story and so proceeds from the surface downwards slowly finding and piecing together such essential fragments of the history as may be recovered in the same way he demands as the archaeologist excavates below the surface and recovers and puts together the fragments of an antique statue much of the material found however has only a symbolic value requiring interpretation and is sometimes pure fantasy fred now attaches great importance to dreams as symbolically representing much in the subject's mental history which is otherwise difficult to reach the subtle and slender clues which freud frequently follows in interpreting dreams cannot fail sometimes to arouse doubt in his readers minds but he certainly seems to have been often successful in thus reaching latent facts in consciousness the primary relation may thus act as a foreign body in consciousness something is introduced into psychic life which refuses to merge in the general flow of consciousness it cannot be accepted simply as other facts of life are accepted it cannot even be talked about and so submitted to the slow user by which our experiences are worn down and gradually transformed Brevo illustrates what happens by reference to the sneezing reflex when an irritation to the nasal mucosal membrane for some reason fails to liberate this reflex a feeling of excitement and tension arises this excitement being unable to stream out along water channels now spreads itself over the brain inhibiting other activities in the highest spheres of human activity we may watch the same process it is a result of this process that brewer and freud found the mere act of confession may greatly relieve the hysterical symptoms produced by this psychic mechanism and in some cases may wholly and permanently remove them it is on this fact that they founded their method of treatment devised by brewer and by him termed the cathartic method though freud prefers to call it the analytic method it is as freud points out the reverse of the hypnotic method of suggestive treatment there is the same difference freud remarks between the two methods as leonardo da vinci found for the two technical methods of art par via de poe and par via de levi the hypnotic method like painting works by putting in the cathartic or analytic method like sculpture works by taking out it is part of the mechanism of this process as understood by these authors that the physical symptoms of hysteria are constituted by a process of conversion out of injured symptoms which then sink into the background or altogether out of consciousness thus they found the prolonged tension of nursing a near and dear relative to be a very frequent factor in the production of hysteria for instance an originally rheumatic pain experienced by a daughter when nursing her father becomes a symbol in memory of a painful psychic excitement and this perhaps for several reasons but chiefly because its presence in consciousness almost exactly coincided with that excitement in another way again nausea and vomiting may become a symbol through the profound sense of disgust with which some emotional shock was associated then the symbol begins to have a life of its own and draws hidden strength from the emotion with which it is correlated brewer and freud have found by careful investigation that the pains and physical troubles of hysteria are far from being capricious but may be traced in a various manner to an origin in some incident some pain some action which is associated with a moment of acute psychic agony the process of conversion was an involuntary escape from an intolerable emotion comparable to the physical pain sometimes sought in intense mental grief and the patient wins some relief from the tortured emotions though at the cost of psychic abnormality of a more or less divided state of consciousness and of physical pain or else anesthesia in charcot's third stage of the hysterical conversion that of attitude specialis brewer and freud see the hallucinatory reproduction of a recollection 
which is full of significance for the origin of historical manifestations. The final result reached by these workers is clearly stated by each writer. The main observation of our predecessors, stated Brewer, still preserved in the word hysteria is nearer to the truth than the more recent view which puts sexuality almost in the last line with the object of protecting the patient from moral reproaches certainly the sexual needs of the hysterical are just as individual and as various in force as those of the healthy but they suffer from them and in large measure indeed they suffer precisely through the struggle with them through the effort to trust sexuality aside the weightiest fact concludes freud on which we strike in a total pursuit of the analysis is this from whatever side and from whatever symptoms we start we always unfailingly reach the reason of the sexual life here first of all an etiological condition of hysterical states is revealed at the bottom of every case of hysteria and reproducible by an analytical effort after even an interval of long years may be found one or more facts of precocious sexual experience belonging to others I regard this as an important result, as the discovery of a caput nullae of new pathology. Ten years later, enlarging rather than restricting his conception, Freud remarks, sexuality is not a mere dual ex machina, which intervenes but once in the hysterical process. It is the motive force of every separate symptom and every expression of a symptom. The morbid phenomena constitute, to speak plainly, the patient's sexual activity. The actual historical feat, Freud now states, may be regarded as the substitute for a once practiced and then abandoned autoerotic satisfaction. And similarly, it may be regarded as an equivalent of coitus. And of Autoeroticism, Part 2, Section 1. Autoeroticism a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse part 2 section 2 of studies in the psychology of sex volume 1 by Havelock Alice this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org read by O123 Autoeroticism a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse part 2 section 2 it is natural to ask how this conception affects the elaborate picture of hysteria laboriously achieved by Charcot and his school. It cannot be said that it abolishes any of the positive results reached by Charcot, but it certainly alters their significance and value. It presents them in a new light and changes the whole perspective. With his passion for getting at tangible definite physical facts, Charcot was on very safe ground. But he was content to neglect the psychic analysis of hysteria, while yet proclaiming that hysteria is a purely psychic disorder. He had no cause of hysteria to present, save only heredity. Freud certainly had misheredity, but as he points out, the part it plays has been overrated. It is too vague and general to carry us far, and when a specific and definite cause can be found, the part played by heredity recedes to become merely a condition the soil on which the specific etiology works. Here probably Freud's enthusiasm at first carried him too far, and the most important modification he has made in his views occurs at this point. He now attaches a preponderant influence to heredity. He has realized that sexual activity in one form or another is far too common in childhood to make it possible to lay very great emphasis on traumatic lesions of this character. And he has also realized that an outcrop of fantasies may somewhat later develop on these childish activities, intervening between them and the subsequent morbid symptoms. He is thus led to emphasize anew the significance of heredity, not, however, in charcoal's sense, as general neuropathic disposition, but as sexual constitution. The significance of infantile sexual relations has also tended to give place to that of infantilism of sexuality. The real merit of Freud's subtle investigations is that, while possibly furnishing a justification of the imperfectly understood idea that had floated in the mind of observers ever since the name hysteria was first invented, he has certainly supplied a definite psychic explanation of a psychic malady. He has succeeded in presenting clearly, at the expense of much labor, insight, and sympathy, 
a dynamic view of the psychic processes involved in the constitution of the historical state. And such a view seems to show that the physical symptoms laboriously brought to light by Charcot are largely but epiphenomena and byproducts of an emotional process, often of tragic significance to the subject, which is taking place in the most sensitive recess of the psychic organism. That the picture of the mechanism involved, presented to us by Professor Freud, cannot be regarded as a final and complete account of the matter may readily be admitted. It has developed in Freud's own hands, and some of the developments will require very considerable confirmation before they can be accepted as generally true. But these investigations have at least served to open the door, which Charcot had inconsistently held closed, into the deeper mysteries of history, and have shown that here, if anywhere, for the research only profitable. They have also served to show that hysteria may be definitely regarded as, in very many cases at least, a manifestation of the sexual emotions and their lesions. In other words, a transformation of autoeroticism. The conception of hysteria so vigorously enforced by Charcot and his school is thus now beginning to appear incomplete. But we have to recognize that that incompleteness was right and necessary. A strong reaction was needed against a widespread view of hysteria that was in large measure scientifically false. It was necessary to show clearly that hysteria is a definite disorder, even when the sexual organs and emotions are swept wholly out of consideration. And it was also necessary to show that the lying and dissimulation so widely attributed to the hysterical were merely the result of an ignorant and unscientific misinterpretation of psychic elements of the disease. This was finally and triumphantly achieved by Charcot's school. There is only one other point in the explanation of hysteria which I will here refer to, and that because it is usually ignored, and because it has relationship to the general psychology of the sexual emotions. I refer to that physiological hysteria, which is the normal counterpart of the pathological hysteria, which has been described in its physical details by Charcot, and to which alone the term should strictly be applied. Even though hysteria as a disease may be described as one and indivisible, there are yet to be found, among the ordinary and fairly healthy population, vague and diffused hysteroid symptoms which are dissipated in a healthy environment, or pass nearly unnoted only to develop in a small proportion of cases under the influence of a more pronounced heredity, or a severe physical or psychic lesion, into that definite morbid state which is properly called hysteria. This diffused hysteroid condition may be illustrated by the results of a psychological investigation carried on in America by Miss Gertrude Stein among the ordinary male and female students of Harvard University and Radcliffe College. The object of the investigation was to study, with the aid of a plan set, the varying liability to automatic movements among normal individuals. Nearly 100 students were submitted to experiment. It was found that automatic responses could be obtained in two sittings from all, but a small proportion of the students of both sexes, but that day were two types of individual who showed a special aptitude. One type, probably showing the embryonic form of neurasthenia, was a nervous, high-strung, imaginative type, not easily influenced from without, and not so much suggestible as autosuggestible. The other type, which is significant from our present point of view, is thus described by Miss Stein. In general, the individuals, often blonde and pale, are distinctly phlegmatic, if emotional, decidedly of the weakest sentimental order. They may be either large, healthy, rather heavy, and lacking in vigor, or they may be what we call anemic and phlegmatic. Their power of concentrated attention is very small. They describe themselves as never being held by their own. They say that their minds wander easily, that they work on after they are tired, and just keep pegging away. They are very apt to have premonitory conversations. They anticipate the words of their friends. They imagine whole conversations that afterward come true. The feeling of having been there is very common with them. That is, they feel under given circumstances that they have had that identical experience before in all its details. They are often fatalistic in their ideas. They indulge in daydreams. As a rule, they are highly suggestive. There have been a picture of the physical constitution and psychic temperament on which the classical symptoms of hysteria might easily be built up. But these persons were ordinary students, 
and while a few of their characteristics are what is commonly and rightly called morbid, on the whole they must be regarded as ordinarily healthy individuals. They have the congenital constitution and predisposition on which some severe circulation and the psychological movement might develop the most definite and obstinate symptoms of hysteria, but under favorable circumstances they will be ordinary men and women, of no more than ordinary abnormality or ordinary power. They are among the many who have been called to hysteria at birth. They may never be among the few who are chosen. We may have to recognize that on the side of the sexual emotions, as well as in general constitution, a condition may be traced among normal persons that is hysteroid in character, and serves as the healthy counterpart of a condition which in hysteria is morbid. In women, such a condition has been traced, though misnamed by Dr. King. Dr. King describes what he calls sexual hysteria in women, which he considers a chief variety of hysteria. He adds, however, that it is not strictly a disease, but simply an automatic reaction of the reproductive system, which tends to become abnormal under conditions of civilization and to be perpetuated in a morbid form. In this condition, he finds twelve characters: one, time of life, usually between puberty and climatide; two, Attacks rarely occur when subject is alone. 3. Subject appears unconscious, but is not really so. 4. C is instinctively ashamed afterward. 5. It occurs usually in single women, or in those single or married, whose sexual needs are unsatisfied. 6. No external evidence of disease, and, as I can point it out, the needs are not flattened. The woman's physical condition is not impaired, and C may be especially attractive to man. 7. Warmth of climate and the season of spring and summer are conducive to the condition. 8. The paroxysm is short and temporary. 9. While light touches are painful, farm pressure and rough handling give relief. 10. It may occur in the occupied, but an idle purposeless life is conducive. 11. The subject delights in exciting sympathy and in being fondled and caressed. 12. There is defect of will and a strong stimulus is required to lead to action. Among civilized women, the author proceeds, this condition does not appear to subserve any useful purpose. Let us, however, go back to aboriginal women, to women of the woods and the fields. Let us picture ourselves a young aboriginal Venus in one of our earliest historical paroxysms. In doing so, let us not forget some of the twelve characteristics previously mentioned. She will not be acting her part alone or if alone, it will be in a place where someone else is likely soon to discover her. Let this Venus be now discovered by a youthful Apollo of the woods. A man with fully developed animal instincts, he and she, like any other animals, are in the free field of nature. He cannot but observe to himself. This woman is not dead. She breathes and is warm. She does not look ill. She is plump and rosy. He speaks to her. She neither hears, apparently, nor responds. Her eyes are closed. He touches, moves, and handles her at his pleasure. She makes no resistance. What will this primitive Apollo do next? He will cure the fit and bring the woman back to consciousness, satisfy her emotions, and restore her volition, not by delicate touches that might be agonizing to her hyperesthetic scheme, but by vigorous massage, passive motions, and succession that will be painless. The emotional process on the part of the woman would end, perhaps with mingled laughter, tears, and shame. And when accused afterward of the part which ancestrally acquired properties of a nervous system had compelled her to act as a preliminary to the event, what woman would not deny it and be angry? But the course of nature having been followed, the natural purpose of the historical paroxysm accomplished, there would remain as a result of the treatment, instead of one discontented woman, two happy people, and the possible beginning of a third. Natural primary sexual history in woman, he concludes, is a temporary modification of the nervous government of the body and the distribution of nerve force, occurring for the most part, as we see it today, in prudish women of strong moral principle, whose volition has disposed them to resist every sort of liberty or approach from the other sex, consisting in a transient abdication of the general volitional and self-preservational ego, while 
the reins of government are temporarily assigned to the usurping power of the reproductive agent, so that the reproductive government overrules the government by volition and does, as it were, forcibly compels the woman's organism to do dispose itself at a suitable time and place, as to allow, invite, and secure the approach of the other sex, whether she will or not, to the end that nature's imperious demand for reproduction shall be obeyed. This perhaps rather fantastic description is not a presentation of hysteria in the technical sense, but we may admit that it presents a state which, if not the real physiological counterpart of the hysterical convulsion, is yet distinctly analogous to the latter. The sexual orgasm has this correspondence with the hysterical field, that they both serve to discharge the nervous centers and relieve emotional tension. It may even happen, especially in the less severe forms of hysteria, that the sexual orgasm takes place during the hysterical feed. This was found by Rosenthal of Vienna to be always the case in the semi-conscious paroxysms of a young girl whose condition was easily cured. No doubt, such cases would be more frequently found if they were sought for. In severe forms of hysteria, however, it frequently happens, as so many observers have noted, that normal sexual excitement has ceased to give satisfaction, has become painful, perverted, paradoxical. Freud has enabled us to see how a shock to the sexual emotions, injury the emotional life at its source, can scarcely fail sometimes to produce such a result. But the necessity for nervous explosion still persists. It may indeed persist even in an abnormally strong degree in consequence of the inhibition of the normal activities generally. The convulsive fit is the only form of relief open to the tension. A lady, whom I long attended, remarks Ashwell, always rejoiced when the fit was over, since it relieved her system generally, and especially her brain, from painful irritation which had existed for several previous days. That the fit mostly fails to give real satisfaction, and that it fails to cure the disease, is due to the fact that it is a morbid form of relief. The same character of history is seen with more satisfactory results, for the most part, in the influence of external nervous shock. It was the misunderstood influence of such shocks in removing hysteria, which in former terms led to the refusal to regard hysteria as a serious disease. During the rebellion of 1745-46 to in Scotland, Cullen remarks that there was little hysteria. The same was true of the French Revolution and of the Irish Rebellion, while Rush, in a study, on the influence of the American Revolution on the human body, observed that many hysterical women were restored to perfect health by the events of the time. In such cases, the emotional tension is given an opportunity to explosion in new and impersonal channels, and the chain of morbid personal emotions is broken. It has been urged by some that the fact that the sexual orgasm usually fails to remove the disorder in true hysteria excludes a sexual factor of hysteria. It is rarely one will point out an argument in favor of such an element as one of the factors of hysteria. If there were no initialization of the sexual emotions, if the natural healthy sexual channel still remained free for the passage of the emotional overflow, then we should expect that it would much oftener come into play the removal of hysteria. In the more healthy, merely hysteroid condition, the psychic sexual organism is not injured and still responds normally removing the abnormal symptoms when allowed to do so. It is the confusion between this almost natural condition and the truly morbid condition, alone properly called hysteria, which lead to the ancient opinion, inaugurated by Plato and Hippocrates, that hysteria may be cured by marriage. The difference may be illustrated by the difference between a distended bladder, which is still able to contact normally on its contents, when at last an opportunity of doing so is afforded and the bladder in which distension has been so prolonged that nervous control had been lost and spontaneous expulsion has become impossible. The first condition corresponds to the constitution, which, while stimulating the hysterical condition, is healthy enough to react normally in spite of psychic lesions. The second corresponds to a state in which, owing to the prolonged stress of psychic traumatism, sexual or not, a definite condition of hysteria has arisen. The one state is healthy, the abnormal, the other is one of pronounced morbidity. The condition of true hysteria is thus linked on to almost healthy states, and especially to a condition which may be described as one of sex hunger. 
Such a suggestion may help us to see these puzzling phenomena in their true nature and perspective. At this point, I may refer to the interesting parallel and probable real relationship between hysteria and chlorosis. As Lucet has said, hysteria and chlorosis are sisters. We have seen that there is some ground for regarding hysteria as an exaggerated form of a normal process which is really an autoerotic phenomenon. There is some ground also for regarding chlorosis as the exaggeration of a physiological state connected with sexual conditions, more especially with the preparation for maternity. Hysteria is so frequently associated with anemic conditions that Pianaki has argued that such conditions really constitute the primary and fundamental cause of hysteria. Neurology Sketch Centre Bla, March 1898. And centuries before Pianaki, Sittenham had stated his belief that poverty of the blood is the chief cause of hysteria. It would be some confirmation of this position if we could believe that chlorosis, like hysteria, is in some degree a congenital condition. This was the view of Vargio, who regarded chlorosis as essentially dependent on a congenital hypoplasia of the arterial system. Steder, on the basis of elaborate study of 23 cases, has endeavored to prove that chlorosis is due to a congenital defect of development. Chestrift for Kavoskov and Gynecology, Volume 32, Part 1, 1895. These facts tend to prove that in chlorosis there are signs of general ill development and that, in particular, there is imperfect development of the breasts and sexual organs, with a tendency to contract a pelvis. Charin, again, regards uterine ovarian inadequacy as at least one of the factors of chlorosis. Chlorosis, in its extreme form, may thus be regarded as a disorder of development, a sign of physical degeneracy. Even if not strictly a cause, a congenital condition, as Stockholm believes, British Medical Journal, December 14, 1895, be a predisposing influence. However, it may be in extreme cases, there is very considerable evidence to indicate that the ordinary enemy of young women may be due to storing up of iron in the system, and is so far normal, being a preparation for the function of reproduction. Some observations of bungees seem to throw much light on the real cause of what may be termed physiological chlorosis. He found by a series of experiments on animals of different ages that young animals contain a much greater amount of iron in their tissues than adult animals. That, for instance, the body of a rabbit an hour after birth contains more than four times as much iron as that of a rabbit two and a half months old. It does appear probable that at the period of puberty and later there is a storage of iron in the system preparatory to the exercise of the maternal functions. It is precisely between the ages of 15 and 23, as Stockman found by an analysis of his own cases, British Medical Journal, December 14, 1895, that the majority of cases occur. There was indeed, he found, no case in which the first onset was later than the age of 23. A similar result is revealed by the charts of Lloyd Jones, which cover a vastly greater number of cases. We owe to Lloyd Jones an important contribution to the knowledge of chlorosis in its physiological or normal relationships. He has shown that chlorosis is but the exaggeration of a condition that is normal at puberty, and in many women at each menstrual period, and which there is good reason to believe even has a favorable influence on fertility. He found that light-complexioned persons are more fertile than the dark-complexioned, and that at the same time, the blood of the later is of less specific gravity, containing less hemoglobin. Roy Jones also reached the generalization that girls who have had chlorosis are often remarkably pretty, so that the tendency to chlorosis is associated with all the sexual and reproductive aptitudes that make a woman attractive to a man. His conclusion is that the normal condition of which chlorosis is the extreme and pathological condition is a preparation for motherhood. Eloy Jones, Chlorosis, the Special Anemia of Young Women, 1897, also numerous reports to the British Medical Association published in the British Medical Journal. There was an interesting discussion of the theories of chlorosis at the Moscow International Medical Congress in 1898. See Proceedings of the Congress, Volume 1, Section 5, page 224. We may thus perhaps understand why it is that hysteria and anemia are often combined, 
and why they are both most frequently found in adolescent young women who have yet had no sexual experiences. Chlorosis is a physical phenomenon, hysteria largely a psychic phenomenon, yet both alike may, to some extent at least, be regarded as sexual aptitude showing itself in extreme and pathological forms. And of Autoeroticism, Part 2, Section 2 Autoeroticism, A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse, Part 3, Section 1, of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autoeroticism, A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse, Part 3, Section 1 The foregoing sketch will serve to show how vast is the field of life, of normal and not merely abnormal life, more or less infused by autoerotic phenomena. If, however, we proceed to investigate precisely the exact extent, degree, and significance of such phenomena, we are met by many difficulties. We find, indeed, that no attempts have been made to study autoerotic phenomena except as regards the group, a somewhat artificial group, as I have already tried to show, collected under the term masturbation, while even here such attempts have only been made among abnormal classes of people, or have been conducted in a manner scarcely likely to yield reliable results. Still, there is a certain significance in the more careful investigations which have been made to ascertain the precise frequency of masturbation. Berger, an experienced specialist in nervous diseases, concluded in his Vorlesungen that ninety-nine per cent of young men and women masturbate occasionally, while the hundredth conceals the truth. And Hermann Kohn appears to accept this statement as generally true in Germany. So high an estimate has of course been called in question, and since it appears to rest on no basis of careful investigation, we need not seriously consider it. It is useless to argue on suppositions, but we must cling to our definite evidence, even though it yields figures which are probably below the mark. Rohleder considers that during adolescence at least ninety-five per cent of both sexes masturbate, but his figures are not founded on precise investigation. Julian Marcuse, on the basis of his own statistics, concludes that ninety-two per cent male individuals have to some extent masturbated in youth. Perhaps also, Weight attaches to the opinion of Dukes, physician to rugby school, who states that from ninety to ninety-five per cent of all boys at boarding school masturbate. Searley of Springfield, Massachusetts, found that of one hundred and twenty-five academic students only eight assured them they had never masturbated, while of three hundred and forty-seven who answered his questions, seventy-one denied that they practiced masturbation, which seems to imply that seventy-nine per cent admitted that they practiced it. Brockman, also in America, among 232 theological students, of the average age of twenty-three and a half years, and coming from various parts of the United States, found that 132 spontaneously admitted that masturbation was their most serious temptation, and all but one of these admitted that he yielded, sixty-nine of them to a considerable extent. This is a proportion of at least fifty-six per cent, the real proportion being doubtless larger, since no question has been asked as to sexual offenses. Seventy-five practiced masturbation after conversion, and twenty-four after they had decided to become ministers. Only sixty-six mentioned sexual intercourse as their chief temptation, but altogether sexual temptations outnumbered all others together. Moraglia, who made inquiry of two hundred women of the lower class in Italy, found that one hundred and twenty acknowledged either that they still masturbate, or that they had done so during a long period. Gualino found that twenty-three per cent of men of the professional classes in northern Italy masturbate about puberty. No account was taken of those who began later. Here in Switzerland, a correspondent writes, I have had occasion to learn from adult men whom I can trust that they have reached the age of twenty-five or over without sexual congress. Wir haben nicht dieses Bedürfnis, is what they said. But I believe that in the case of the Swiss mountaineers, moderate onanism is practiced as a rule. In hot countries the same habits are found at a more precocious age. 
In Venezuela, for instance, among the Spanish Creoles, Ernst found that in all classes boys and girls are infested with the vice of onanism. They learn it early in the very beginning of life from their wet nurses, generally low mulatto women, and many reasons help to foster the habit. The young men are often dissipated, and the young women often remain single. Nisiforo, who shows a special knowledge of the working girl class at Rome, states that in many milliners' and dressmakers' workrooms where young girls are employed, it frequently happens that during the hottest hours of the day, between twelve and two, when the mistress or forewoman is asleep, all the girls without exception give themselves up to masturbation. In France, a country curé assured de Brenne that among the little girls who come up for their first communion, eleven out of twelve were given to masturbation. The medical officer of a Prussian reformatory told Roll Ada that nearly all the inmates over the age of puberty masturbated. Stanley Hall knew a reform school in America where masturbation was practiced without exception, and he who could practice it oftenest was regarded with hero worship. Ferriani, who has made an elaborate study of youthful criminality in Italy, states that even if all boys and girls among the general population do not masturbate, it is certainly so among those who have a tendency to crime. Among 458 adult male criminals, Maro, as he states in his Caratteri dei Delinquenti, found that only 72 denied masturbation, while 386 had practiced it from an early age, 140 of them before the age of 13. Among 30 criminal women, Moraglia found that 24 acknowledged the practice, at all events in early youth, eight of them before the age of 10, a precocity accompanied by average precocity in menstruation while he suspected that most of the remainder were not unfamiliar with the practice. Among prostitutes of whatever class or position, Moraglia found masturbation, though it must be pointed out that he does not appear to distinguish masturbation very clearly from homosexual practices, to be universal. In one group of fifty prostitutes everyone had practiced masturbation at some period. Twenty-eight began between the ages of six and eleven, nineteen between twelve and fourteen, the most usual period, a precocious one, of commencing puberty. The remaining three at fifteen and sixteen. The average age of commencing masturbation, it may be added, was eleven, while that of the first sexual intercourse was fifteen. In a larger group of one hundred and eighty prostitutes belonging to Genoa, Turin, Venice, etc., and among twenty-three elegant cocottes of Italian and foreign origin, Moraglia obtained the same results. Everyone admitted masturbation, and not less than one hundred and thirteen preferred masturbation, either solitary or mutual, to normal coitus. Among the insane, as among idiots, masturbation is somewhat more common among males, according to Blandford in England, as also it is in Germany, according to Necke, while Venturi in Italy has found it more common among females. There appears to be no limit to the age at which spontaneous masturbation may begin to appear. I have already referred to the practice of thigh-rubbing in infants under one year of age. J. P. West has reported in detail three cases of masturbation in very early childhood, two in girls, one in a boy in which the practice has been acquired spontaneously and could only be traced to some source of irritation and pressure from clothing, etc. Probably there is often in such cases some hereditary lack of nervous stability. Bloch has recorded the case of a girl, very bright for her age, though excessively shy and taciturn, who began masturbating spontaneously at the age of two. In this case, the mother had masturbated all her life, even continuing the practice after marriage, and though she succeeded in refraining during pregnancy, her thoughts still dwelt upon it, while the maternal grandmother had died in an asylum from masturbatory insanity. Freud considers that autoerotic manifestations are common in infancy, and that the rhythmic function of any sensitive spot, primarily the lips, may easily pass into masturbation. He regards the infantile manifestations of which thumb-sucking is the most familiar example, Ludeln or Lutschen in German, as autoerotic, the germ arising in sucking the breasts since the lips are an erogenous zone which may easily be excited by the warm stream of milk. But this only occurs, he points out, in subjects in whom the sensitivity of the lip zone is heightened, and especially in those who at a later age are liable to become hysterical. Shuttleworth also points out that the mere fidgetiness of a neurotic infant, even when only a few months old, sometimes leads to the spontaneous and accidental discovery of pleasurable sexual sensations which for a time appease the restlessness of nervous instability, though a vicious circle is thus established. 
he has found that especially among quite young girls of neurotic heredity, self-induced excitement, often in the form of thigh friction, is more common than is usually supposed. Normally, there appears to be a varying aptitude to experience the sexual organism, or any voluptuous sensations before puberty. I find, on eliciting the recollections of normal persons, that in some cases there have been voluptuous sensations from casual contact with the sexual organs at a very early age. In other cases there has been occasional slight excitement from early years, in yet other cases complete sexual anesthesia until the age of puberty. That the latter condition is not due to mere absence of peripheral irritation is shown by a case I am acquainted with, in which a boy of seven, incited by a companion, innocently attempted at intervals during several weeks to produce erection by friction of the penis. No result of any kind followed, although erections occurred spontaneously at puberty with normal sexual feelings. I am indebted to a correspondent for the following notes. From my observation during five years at a boarding school, it seems that eight out of ten boys were more or less addicted to the practice, but I would not state positively that such was the proportion of masturbators among an average of thirty pupils, though the habit was very common. I know that in one bedroom, sleeping seven boys, the whole number masturbated frequently. The act was performed in bed, in the closets, and sometimes in the classrooms during lessons. Inquiry among my friends as to onanism, in the boarding schools to which they were sent, elicited somewhat contradictory answers concerning the frequency of the habit. Dr. Blank, who went to a French school, told me that all the older boys had younger accomplices in mutual masturbation. He also spoke with experience of the prevalence of the practice in a well-known public school in the west of England. B. said all the boys at his school masturbated. G. stated that most of his schoolmates were onanists. L. said more than half was the proportion. At my school, manual masturbation was both solitary and mutual, and sometimes younger boys, who had not acquired the habit, were induced to manipulate bigger boys. One very precocious boy of fifteen always chose a companion of ten because his hand was like a woman's. Sometimes boys entered their friend's bed for mutual excitement. In after life they showed no signs of inversion. Another boy, aged about fourteen, who had been seduced by a servant girl, embraced the bolster. The pleasurable sensations, according to his statement, were heightened by imagining that the bolster was a woman. He said that the enjoyment of the act was greatly increased during the holidays, when he was able to spread a pair of his sister's drawers upon the pillow, and so intensify the illusion. Before puberty the boys appeared to be more continent than afterward. A few of the older and more intelligent masturbators regulated the habit, as some married men regulate intercourse. The big boy referred to, who chose always the same manipulator, professed to indulge only once in twenty days, his reason being that more frequent repetition of the act would injure his health. About twice a week for boys who had reached puberty, and once a week for younger boys, was I think about the average indulgence. I had never met with a parallel of one of those cases of excessive masturbation recorded by many doctors. There may have been such cases at this school, but if so, the boys concealed the frequency of their gratifications. My experience proved that many of the lads regarded masturbation as reprehensible, but their plea was, everyone does it. Some, often those who indulged inordinately and more secretly than their companions, gravely condemned the practice as sinful. A few seemed to think there was no harm in it, but that the habit might stunt the growth and weaken the body if practiced very frequently. The greater number made no attempt to conceal the habit. They enlarged upon the pleasure of it. It was ever so much nicer than eating tarts, etc. The chief cause, I believe, to be the initiation by an older schoolmate. But I have known accidental causes, such as the discovery that swarming up a pole pleasurably excited the organ, rubbing to allay an irritation, and simply curious handling of the erect penis in the early morning before rising from bed. I quote the foregoing communication as perhaps a fairly typical experience in a British school, though I am myself inclined to think that the prevalence of masturbation in schools is often much overrated, for while in some schools the practice is doubtless rampant, in others it is practically unknown, or at all events only practiced by a few individuals in secret. My own early recollections of private school life fail to yield any reminiscences of any kind connected with either masturbation or homosexuality and while such happy ignorance may be the exception rather than the rule, I am certainly inclined to believe that, owing to race and climate and healthier conditions of life, 
the sexual impulse is less precocious and less prominently developed during the school age in England than in some continental countries. It is probably to this delayed development that we should attribute the contrast that Ferrero finds, and certainly states too absolutely between the sexual reserve of young Englishmen and the sexual immodesty of his own countrymen. In Germany, Necke has also stated that he heard nothing at school either of masturbation or homosexuality, and he records the experience of medical friends who stated that such phenomena were only rare exceptions, and regarded by the majority of the boys as exhibitions of Schweinerei. At other German schools, as Hoche has shown, sexual practices are very prevalent. It is evident that at different schools, and even at the same school at different times, these manifestations vary in frequency within wide limits. Such variations, it seems to me, are due to two causes. In the first place, they largely depend upon the character of the more influential elder boys. In the second place, they depend upon the attitude of the headmaster. With reference to this point, I may quote from a letter written by an experienced master in one of the most famous English public schools. When I first came to Blank a quarter of a century ago, Dr. Blank was making a crusade against this failing. Boys were sent away wholesale. The school was summoned and lectured solemnly, and the more the severities, the more rampant the disease. I thought to myself that the remedy was creating the malady, and I heard afterward from an old boy that in those days they used to talk things over by the fireside, and think there must be something very choice in a sin that braved so much. Dr. Blank went, and under Blank we never spoke of such things. Curiosity died down, and the thing itself, I believe, was lessened. We were told to warn new boys of the dangers to health and morals of such offences, lest the innocent should be caught in ignorance. I have only spoken to a few. I think the great thing is not to put it in boys' heads. I have noticed solitary faults most commonly, and then I tell the boy how he is physically weakening himself. If you notice, it is puppies that seem to go against nature, but grown dogs never. So, if two small boys acted thus, I should think it merely an instinctive feeling after nature which would amend itself. Many here would consider it a heinous sin. But those who think such things sins make them sins. I have seen in the old days most delightful little children sent away, branded with infamy, and scarce knowing why. You might as well expel a boy for scratching his head when it itched. I am sure the soundest way is to treat it as a doctor would, and explain to the boy the physical effects of overindulgence of any sort. When it is combated from the monkish standpoint, the evil becomes an epidemic. I am, however, far from anxious to endorse the policy of ignoring the sexual phenomena of youth. It is not the speaking about such things that should be called in question, but the wisdom and good sense of the speaker. We ought to expect a headmaster to possess both an adequate acquaintance with the nature of the phenomena of autoerotism and homosexuality, and a reasonable amount of tact in dealing with boys. He may then fairly be trusted to exercise his own judgment. It may be doubted whether boys should be made too alive to the existence of sexual phenomena. There can be no doubt about their teachers. The same is, of course, true as regards girls among whom the same phenomena, though less obtrusive, are not less liable to occur. As to whether masturbation is more common in one sex than the other, there have been considerable differences of opinion. Tissot considered it more prevalent among women. Christian believed it commoner among men. Deland and Ivan Bloch hold that there are no sexual differences, and Garnier was doubtful. Lawson Tate, in his Diseases of Women, stated his opinion that in England, while very common among boys, it is relatively rare among women, and then usually taught. Spitzka, in America, also found it relatively rare among women, and Dana considers it commoner in boys than in girls or adults. Moll is inclined to think that masturbation is less common in women and girls than in the male sex. Rohleder believes that after puberty, when it is equally common in both sexes, it is more frequently found in men, but that women masturbate with more passion and imaginative fervor. Kellogg, in America, says it is equally prevalent in both sexes, but that women are more secretive. Morris, also in America, considers, on the other hand, that persistent masturbation is commoner in women, and accounts for this by the healthier life and traditions of boys. Pouillet, who studied the matter with considerable thoroughness in France, came to the conclusion that masturbation is commoner among women, among whom he found it to be equally prevalent in rich and poor, and especially so in the great centers of civilization. In Russia, Gutzeit states in his Dreisigyara Praxis that from the ages of ten to sixteen boys masturbate more than girls, 
who know less about the practice which has not for them the charm of a forbidden. But after sixteen he finds the practice more frequent in girls and women than in youths and men. Necke, in Germany, believes that there is much evidence pointing in the same direction, and Adler considers masturbation very common in women. Maraglia is decidedly of the opinion, on the ground of his own observations already alluded to, that masturbation is more frequent among women. He refers to the fact, a very significant fact, as I shall elsewhere have to point out, that while in men there is only one sexual center, the penis, in women there are several centers, the clitoris, the vagina, the uterus, the breasts, and he mentions that he knew a prostitute, a well-developed brunette of somewhat nervous temperament, who boasted that she knew fourteen ways of masturbating herself. My own opinion is that the question of the sexual distribution of masturbation has been somewhat obscured by that harmful tendency, to which I have already alluded, to concentrate attention on a particular set of autoerotic phenomena. We must group and divide our facts rationally if we wish to command them. If we confine our attention to very young children, the available evidence shows that the practice is much more common in females, and such a result is in harmony with the fact that precocious puberty is most often found in female children. At puberty and adolescence, occasional or frequent masturbation is common in both boys and girls, though I believe less common than it is sometimes supposed. It is difficult to say whether it is more prevalent among boys or girls. One is inclined to include that it prevails more widely among boys. The sexual impulse, and consequently the tendency to masturbation, tend to be aroused later and less easily in girls than in youths, though it must also be remembered that boys' traditions and their more active life keep the tendency in abeyance, while in girls there is much less frequently any restraining influence of corresponding character. In my study of inversion I have found that ignorance and the same absence of tradition are probably factors in the prevalence of homosexual tendencies among women. After adolescence I think there can be no doubt that masturbation is more common in women than in men. Men have by this time mostly adopted some method of sexual gratification with the opposite sex. Women are to a much larger extent shut out from such gratification. Moreover, while in rare cases women are sexually precocious, it more often happens that their sexual impulses only gain strength and self-consciousness after adolescence has passed. I have been much impressed by the frequency with which masturbation is occasionally, especially about the period of menstruation, practiced by active, intelligent, and healthy women, who otherwise lead a chaste life. This experience is confirmed by others who are in a position to ascertain the facts among normal people. Thus, a lady who has received the confidence of many women, told me that she believes that all women who remain unmarried masturbate, as she found so much evidence pointing in this direction. This statement certainly needs some qualification, though I believe it is not far from the truth as regards young and healthy women, who, after having normal sexual relationships, have been compelled for some reason or other to break them off and lead a lonely life. But we have to remember that there are some women, evidently with a considerable degree of congenital sexual anesthesia, no doubt in some respect or another below the standard of normal health, in whom the sexual instinct has never been aroused, and who not only do not masturbate, but do not show any desire for normal gratification, while in a large proportion of other cases the impulse is gratified passively in ways I have already referred to. The autoerotic phenomena, which take place in this way spontaneously, by yielding to reverie, with little or no active interference, certainly occur much more frequently in women than in men. On the other hand, contrary to what one might be led to expect, the closely related autoerotic phenomena during sleep seem to take place more frequently in men, although in women, as we have found ground for concluding, they reverberate much more widely and impressively on the waking psychical life. We owe to Restif de la Bretonne what is perhaps the earliest precise description of a woman masturbating. In 1755 he knew a dark young woman, plain but well-made, and of warm temperament, educated in a convent. She was observed one day, when gazing from her window at a young man in whom she was tenderly interested, to become much excited. Her movements became agitated. I approached her, and really believed that she was uttering affectionate expressions. She had become red. Then she sighed deeply, and became motionless, stretching out her legs, which she stiffened as if she felt pain. It is further hinted that her hands took part in this maneuver. Pictorial representations of a woman masturbating also occur in eighteenth-century engravings. Thus, in France, Baudouin's Le Midi represents an elegant young lady in a rococo garden bower, 
She has been reading a book she has now just dropped, together with her sunshade. She leans languorously back, and her hand begins to find its way through her placket hole. Adler, who has studied masturbation in women with more care than any previous writer, has recorded in detail the autoerotic manifestations involved in the case of an intelligent and unprejudiced woman, aged thirty, who had begun masturbating when twenty, and practiced it at intervals of a few weeks. She experienced the desire for sexual gratification under the following circumstances. 1. Spontaneously directly before or after menstruation. 2. As a method to cure sleeplessness. 3. After washing the parts with warm, but not cold, water. 4. After erotic dreams. 5. Quite suddenly, without definite cause. The phenomena of the masturbatory process fell into two stages. 1. Incomplete excitement. 2. The highest pleasurable gratification. It only took place in the evening or at night, and a special position was necessary, with the right knee bent and the right foot against the knee of the extended left leg. The bent index and middle fingers of the right hand were then applied firmly to the lower third of the left labium minus, which was rubbed against the underlying parts. At this stage the manifestation sometimes stopped, either from an effort of self-control or from fatigue of the arm. There was no emission of mucus or general perspiration, but some degree of satisfaction and of fatigue followed by sleep. If, however, the manipulation was continued, the second stage was reached, and the middle finger sank into the vagina, while the index finger remained on the labium, the rest of the hand holding and compressing the whole of the vulva from pubis to anus, against the symphysis, with a backwards and forwards movement, the left hand also being frequently used to support and assist the right. The parts now gave a mushroom-like feeling to the touch, and in a few seconds, or after a longer interval, the complete feeling of pleasurable satisfaction was attained. At the same moment there was, but only after she had had experience of coitus, an involuntary elevation of the pelvis, together with the emission of mucus, making the hand wet, this mucus having an odor and being quite distinct from the ordinary odorless mucus of the vagina. At the same time the finger in the vagina felt slight contractions of the whole vaginal wall. The climax of sexual pleasure lasted a few seconds, with its concomitant vaginal contractions, then slowly subsided with a feeling of general well-being, the finger at the same time slipping out of the vagina, and she was left in a state of general perspiration, and sleep would immediately follow. When this was not the case, she was frequently conscious of some degree of sensibility in the sacrum lasting for several hours, and especially felt when sitting. When masturbation was the result of an erotic dream, which occurred but seldom, the first stage was already reached in sleep, and the second was more quickly obtained. During the act it was only occasionally that any thoughts of men or of coitus were present, the attention being fixed on the coming climax. The psychic state afterwards was usually one of self-reproach. The phenomena in this case may be regarded as fairly typical, but there are many individual variations. Mucus emissions and vaginal contractions frequently occur before actual orgasm, and there is not usually any insertion of the finger into the vagina in women who have never experienced coitus, or indeed even in those who have. End of Autoeroticism Part 3 Section 1《Autoeroticism — A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse, Part 3, Section 2, of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Autoeroticism — A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse, Part 3, Section 2. We must now turn to that aspect of our subject which in the past has always seemed the only aspect of autoerotic phenomena meriting attention, the symptoms and results of chronic masturbation. It appears to have been an Englishman who at the beginning of the eighteenth century first called popular attention to the supposed evils of masturbation. His book was published in London and entitled Onania, or the Heinous Sin of Self-Pollution, and All Its Frightful Consequences in Both Sexes considered with spiritual and physical advice, etc. It is not a serious medical treatise, but an early and certainly superior example of a kind of literature which we have since become familiar with through the daily newspapers. A large part of the book, which is cleverly written, 
is devoted in the later editions to the letters of nervous and hypochondriacal young men and women, who are too shy to visit the author, but request him to send a bottle of his strengthening tincture, and mention that they are enclosing half a guinea, a guinea, or still larger sum. Concerning the composition of the strengthening tincture, we are not informed. This work, which was subsequently attributed to a writer named Beckers, is said to have passed through no less than eighty editions, and was translated into German. Tissot, a physician of Lausanne, followed with his Traité de l'Onanisme, Dissertation sur la maladie produite par la masturbation, first published in Latin, 1760, then in French, 1764, and afterwards in nearly all European languages. He regarded masturbation as a crime, and as an act of suicide. His book is a production of amusing exaggeration and rhetoric, zealously setting forth the prodigious evils of masturbation in a style which combines, as Christian remarks, the strains of Rousseau with a vein of religious piety. Tissot included only manual self-abuse under the term onanism. Shortly afterward, Voltaire, in his Dictionnaire philosophique, took up the subject, giving it a wider meaning, and still further popularizing it. Finally, La Lémon, at a somewhat later period, 1836, wrote a book which was indeed more scientific in character, but which still sought to represent masturbation as the source of all evils. These four writers, the author of Onania, Tissot, Voltaire, Lallemand, are certainly responsible for much. The mistaken notions of many medical authorities, carried on by tradition even down to our own time, the powerful lever which has been put in the hand of unscrupulous quacks, the suffering, dread, and remorse experienced in silence by many thousands of ignorant and often innocent young people, may all be traced in large measure back to these four well-meaning, but on this question misguided, authors. There is really no end to the list of real or supposed symptoms and results of masturbation, as given by various medical writers during the last century. Insanity, epilepsy, numerous forms of eye disease, supraorbital headache, occipital headache, strange sensations at the top of the head, various forms of neuralgia, tenderness of the skin in the lower dorsal region, mammary tenderness in young girls, mammary hypertrophy, asthma, cardiac murmurs, the appearance of vesicles on wounds, acne and other forms of cutaneous eruptions, dilated pupils, eyes directed upwards and sideways, dark rings around the eyes, intermittent functional deafness, painful menstruation, catarrh of uterus and vagina, ovarian disease, pale and discolored skin, redness of nose, epistaxis, morbid changes in nose, convulsive cough of puberty, acidity of vagina, incontinence of urine in young women, warts on the hands in women, hallucinations of smell and hearing, intermittent functional deafness, indican in the urine, an indescribable odor of the skin in women, these are but a few of the signs and consequences of masturbation given by various prominent authorities. That many of these manifestations do occur in connection with masturbation is unquestionable. There is also good reason to believe that some of them may be the results of masturbation acting on an imperfectly healthy organism. But in all such cases we must speak with great caution, for there appears to be little reliable evidence to show that simple masturbation in a well-born and healthy individual can produce any evil results beyond slight dysfunctional disturbances, and these only when it is practiced in excess. To illustrate the real pathological relationships of masturbation, a few typical and important disorders may be briefly considered. The delicate mechanism of the eye is one of the first portions of the nervous apparatus to be disturbed by any undue strain on the system. It is not surprising that masturbation should be widely incriminated as a cause of eye troubles. If, however, we inquire into the results obtained by the most cautious and experienced ophthalmological observers, it grows evident that masturbation as a cause of disease of the eye becomes merged into wider causes. In Germany, Hermann Kohn, the distinguished ophthalmic surgeon of Breslau, has dealt fully with the question. Kohn, who believes that all young men and women masturbate to some extent, finds that masturbation must be excessive for eye trouble to become apparent. In most of his cases there was masturbation several times daily during from five to seven years, in many during ten years, and in one during twenty-three years. In such cases we are obviously dealing with abnormal persons, and no one will dispute the possibility of harmful results. In some of the cases, when masturbation was stopped, the eye trouble improved. Even in these cases, however, the troubles were but slight, the chief being, apparently, photopsia, a subjective sensation of light with otherwise normal conditions of pupil, vision, color sense, and retina. 
In some cases there was photophobia, and he has also found paralysis of accommodation and conjunctivitis. At a later date, Salmo Cohn, in his comprehensive monograph on the relationship between the eye and the sexual organs in women, brought together numerous cases of eye troubles in young women associated with masturbation. But in most of these cases masturbation has been practiced with great frequency for a long period, and the ocular affections were usually not serious. In England, Power has investigated the relations of the sexual system to eye disease. He is inclined to think that the effects of masturbation have been exaggerated, but he believes that it may produce such, for the most part, trivial complaints as photopsise, muscse, muscular asthenopia, possibly blepharospasm, and perhaps conjunctivitis. He goes on, however, to point out that more serious complaints of the eye are caused by excess in normal coitus, by sexual abstinence, and especially by disordered menstruation. Thus, we see that even when we are considering a mechanism so delicately poised and one so easily disturbed by any jar of the system as vision, masturbation produces no effect except when carried to an extent which argues a hereditarily imperfect organism, while even in these cases the effects are usually but slight, moreover, in no respect specific, but are paralleled and even exceeded by the results of other disturbances of the sexual system. Let us turn to the supposed influence of masturbation in causing insanity and nervous diseases. Here we may chiefly realize the immense influence exerted on medical science by Tissot and his followers during a hundred years. Mental weakness is the cause, and not the result, of excessive masturbation, Gall declared, but he was a man of genius, in isolation. Sir William Ellis, an alienist of considerable reputation at the beginning of last century, could write with scientific equanimity, I have no hesitation in saying that in a very large number of patients in all public asylums the disease may be attributed to that cause. He does, indeed, admit that it may be only a symptom sometimes, but goes on to assert that masturbation has not hitherto been exhibited in the awful light in which it deserves to be shown, and that in by far the great number of cases it is the true cause of dementia. Esquirol lent his name and influence to a similar view of the pernicious influence of masturbation. Throughout the century, even down to the present day, this point of view has been traditionally preserved in a modified form. In apparent ignorance of the enormous prevalence of masturbation, and without, so far as can be seen, any attempt to distinguish between cause and effect, or to eliminate the hereditary neuropathic element, many alienists have set down a large proportion of cases of insanity, idiocy, epilepsy, and disease of the spinal cord to uncomplicated masturbation. Thus, at the Mateawan State Hospital, New York, for criminal lunatics and insane prisoners, from 1875 to 1907, masturbation was the sole assigned cause of insanity in 160 men out of 2,595, while, according to Dr. Clara Barris, among 121 cases of insanity in young women, masturbation is the cause in ten cases. It is unnecessary to multiply examples, for this traditional tendency is familiar to all. It appears to have been largely due to Griesinger, in the middle of the last century, that we owe the first authoritative appearance of a saner, more discriminating view regarding the results of masturbation. Although still to some extent fettered by the traditions prevalent in his day, Griesinger saw it was not so much masturbation itself as the feelings aroused in sensitive minds by the social attitude toward masturbation which produced evil effects. That constant struggle, he wrote, against a desire which is even overpowering, and to which the individual always in the end succumbs, that hidden strife between shame, repentance, good intentions, and the irritation which impels to the act, this, after not a little acquaintance with onanists, we consider to be far more important than the primary direct physical effect. He added that there are no specific signs of masturbation, and concluded that it is oftener a symptom than a cause. The general progress of educated opinion since that date has in the main confirmed and carried forward the results cautiously stated by Griesinger. This distinguished alienist thought that, when practiced in childhood, masturbation might lead to insanity. Burkan, in his investigation of the psychoses of childhood, found that in no single case was masturbation a cause. Vogel, Uffelmann, and Emminghaus, in the course of similar studies, have all come to almost similar conclusions. It is only on a congenitally morbid nervous system, Emminghaus insists, that masturbation can produce any serious results. Most of the cases charged to masturbation, writes Kiernan in a private letter, basing his opinion on wide clinical experience, are either hebephrenia or hysteria in which an effect is taken for the cause. 
Christian, during twenty years' experience in hospitals, asylums, and private practice in town and country, has not found any seriously evil effects from masturbation. He thinks, indeed, that it may be a more serious evil in women than in men. But Yellowlees considers that in women it is possibly less exhausting and injurious than in the other sex, which was also the opinion of Hammond as well as of Goodsight, though he found that women pushed the practice much further than men. And Nicke, who was given special attention to this point, could not find that masturbation is a definite cause of insanity in women in a single case. Koch also reaches a similar conclusion as regards both sexes, though he admits that masturbation may cause some degree of psychopathic deterioration. Even in this respect, however, he points out that when practiced in moderation it is not injurious in the certain and exceptionless way in which it is believed to be in many circles. It is the people whose nervous systems are already injured who masturbate most easily and practice it more immoderately than others. The chief source of its evil is self-reproach and the struggle with the impulse. Kalbaum, it is true, under the influence of the older tradition, when he erected catatonia into a separate disorder, not always accepted in later times, regarded prolonged and excessive masturbation as a chief cause, but I am not aware that he ever asserted that it was a sole and sufficient cause in a healthy organism. Kiernan, one of the earliest writers on catatonia, was careful to point out that masturbation was probably as much effect as cause of the morbid nervous condition. Maudsley, in body and mind, recognized masturbation as a special exciting cause of a characteristic form of insanity, but he cautiously added, Nevertheless, I think that self-abuse seldom, if ever, produces it without the cooperation of the insane neurosis. Schule also recognized a specific masturbatory insanity, but the general tendency to reject any such nosological form is becoming marked. Kraft Ebing long since rejected it, and Necke decidedly opposes it. Kreppelin states that excessive masturbation can only occur in a dangerous degree in predisposed subjects. So also Forel and Löwenfeld, as at an earlier period Trousseau. It is true that Marot, in his admirable and detailed study of the normal and abnormal aspects of puberty, accepts a form of masturbatory insanity, but the only illustrative case he brings forward is a young man possessing various stigmata of degeneracy and the son of an alcoholic father. Such a case tells us nothing regarding the results of simple masturbation. Even Spitzka, who maintained several years ago the traditional views as to the terrible results of masturbation, and recognized a special insanity of masturbation, stated his conclusions with a caution that undermined his position. Self-abuse, he concluded, to become a sole cause of insanity must be begun early and carried very far. In persons of sound antecedents it rarely, under these circumstances, suffices to produce an actual vesenia. When we remember that there is no convincing evidence to show that masturbation is begun early and carried very far by persons of sound antecedents, the significance of Spitka's typical psychosis of masturbation is somewhat annulled. It is evident that these distinguished investigators, Morrow and Spitzka, have been induced by tradition to take up a position which their own scientific consciences have compelled them practically to evacuate. Recent authorities are almost unanimous in rejecting masturbation as a cause of insanity. Thus, Roleda, in his comprehensive monograph, although taking a very serious view of the evil results of masturbation, points out the unanimity which is now tending to prevail on this point, and lays it down that masturbation is never the direct cause of insanity. Sexual excesses of any kind, he adds, can, at the most, merely give an impetus to a latent form of insanity. On the whole, he concludes, the best authorities are unanimous in agreeing that masturbation may certainly injure mental capacity by weakening memory and depressing intellectual energy, that further, in hereditarily neurotic subjects, it may produce slight psychoses like folie de dut, hypochondria, hysteria, that finally, under no circumstances can it produce severe psychoses like paranoia or general paralysis. If it caused insanity as often as some claim, as Kellogg remarks, the whole race would long since have passed into masturbatic degeneracy of mind. It is especially injurious in the very young, and in all who have weak nervous systems. But the physical traits attributed to the habit are common to thousands of neurasthenic and neurotic individuals. Again, at the outset of the article on masturbation in Tuke's Dictionary of Psychological Medicine, Yellow Lee states that on account of the mischief formerly done by reckless statements, it is necessary to state plainly that unless the practice has been long and greatly indulged, no permanent evil effects may be observed to follow. Necke, again, has declared there are neither somatic nor psychic symptoms peculiar on onanism, 
nor is there any specific onanistic psychosis. I am prepared to deny that onanism ever produces any psychoses in those who are not already predisposed. That such a view is now becoming widely prevalent is illustrated by the cautious and temperate discussion of masturbation in a recent work by a non-medical writer, Geoffrey Mortimer. The testimony of expert witnesses with regard to the influence of masturbation in producing other forms of psychoses and neuroses is becoming equally decisive, and here, also, the traditions of Tissot are being slowly effaced. I have not, in the whole of my practice, wrote West forty years ago, out of a large experience among children and women, seen convulsions, epilepsy, or idiocy induced by masturbation in any child of either sex. Neither have I seen any instance in which hysteria, epilepsy, or insanity in women after puberty was due to masturbation, as its efficient cause. Gower speaks somewhat less positively, but regards masturbation as not so much a cause of true epilepsy as of atypical attacks, sometimes of a character intermediate between the hysteroid and the epileptoid form. This relationship he has frequently seen in boys. Leyden, among the causes of diseases of the spinal cord, does not include any form of sexual excess. In moderation, Erb remarks, masturbation is not more dangerous to the spinal cord than natural coitus, and has no bad effects. It makes no difference, Erb considers, whether the orgasm is affected normally or in solitude. This is also the opinion of Toulouse, of Fuebringer, and of Kurschmann, as at an earlier period it was of Roubault. While these authorities are doubtless justified in refusing to ascribe to masturbation any part in the production of psychic or nervous diseases, it seems to me that they are going somewhat beyond their province when they assert that masturbation has no more injurious effect than coitus. If sexual coitus were a purely physiological phenomenon, this position would be sound. But the sexual orgasm is normally bound up with a mass of powerful emotions aroused by a person of the opposite sex. It is in the joy caused by the play of these emotions, as well as in the discharge of the sexual orgasm, that the satisfaction of coitus resides. In the absence of the desired partner, the orgasm, whatever relief it may give, must be followed by a sense of dissatisfaction, perhaps of depression, even of exhaustion, often of shame and remorse. The same remark has since been made by Stanley Hall. Practically also, as John Hunter pointed out, there is more probability of excess in masturbation than in coitus. Whether, as some have asserted, masturbation involves a greater nervous effort than coitus, is more doubtful. It thus seems somewhat misleading to assert that masturbation has no more injurious effect than coitus. Reviewing the general question of the supposed grave symptoms and signs of masturbation, and its pernicious results, we may reach the conclusion that in the case of moderate masturbation, in healthy, well-born individuals, no seriously pernicious results necessarily follow. With regard to the general signs, we may accept, as concerns both sexes, what the Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Berlin decided in 1861, in a discussion of it in women, that there are none which can be regarded as reliable. We may conclude finally with Clouston that the opposing views on the subject may be simply explained by the fact that the writers on both sides have ignored or insufficiently recognized the influence of heredity and temperament. They have done precisely what so many unscientific writers on inebriety have continued to do unto the present day, when describing the terrible results of alcohol, without pointing out that the chief factor in such cases has not been the alcohol, but the organization on which the alcohol acted. Excess may act, according to the familiar old-fashioned adage, like the lighted match. But we must always remember the obvious truth, that it makes a considerable difference whether you threw your lighted match into a powder magazine or into